sponsorship for this episode goes to Dan's Rentals, who's been a longtime supporter of the Kevin Unscripted podcast. Uh, with co-owner Chris Shire, has been a guest on this uh, podcast a couple times, episode two and also 12, possibly a third in the future. Uh, a little history of Dan's, it's, uh, they were started in 2002 by Dan Rohn, who had a very strong work ethic, knowledge and standard of service that built the company with a reputation of expertise in the industry. 2019, Chris Schreier and Dwayne Sawchuck purchased Dan's Rentals, and since then they've grown and expanded into the Grand Prairie, Alberta area. Dan's Rentals provides a lot more than just rental equipment. With experienced field personnel and specialty downhole tool assemblies, or BHAs, they have what you need in virt for virtually any operation, ranging from completions, work over, abandonments, or their specialty, which is deep base and critical sour. Whether you need a wellhead crossover connection for coil or rig operations, maybe an overshot for a rig job or a BHA assemblies, for those dynamic jobs, the first and only call you'll need is to Dan's Rentals for leading edge industry experience. Give me a shout at one or two of the branches, which is Fort St. John, 250-785-6100, or the Grand Prairie office, which is 780-228-6616. And they've also got a, let me share this here real quick, uh, website, which I'd like to show, with, show it to you. Here you go. This is what it looks like with the uh, two branches, Fort St. John and Grand Prairie. Here they've got a little brief history of, of who they are. You scroll down and they've got you a little more contact information along with some of the services they provide uh, and projects and whatnot. So I'll give them a shout and uh, onward with the show. Thanks a lot. <coughs> we are now live. This is exciting. There's no turning around now. <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome to Kevin Unscripted. I'll start with Aaron as a as someone who's already been on the podcast. Returning guest. Yeah, with uh, Tim. I just got a note here because that was back in, it was last year. I think it was actually pretty much a year to yep. the month, at least anyway. Yeah. You and Tim were here. Minus 35. I remember it was a freezing cold day. Yeah, we got lucky <laughs> right this now. time because I think this weekend we're going to be walking into the same kind of weather. Yep. Episode 37. Uh, it was a little while ago now. Oh, so. for sure. And uh, Jeremy Evans, welcome to the studio and Kevin Unscripted. Uh, I've been kind of looking forward to this for a little while. Is he getting a little excited? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, welcome to welcome to the show. Um, I'll just kind of do a little bit more of a formal uh, introduction, and then at least uh, the the um, listener over there is like I said, the first time we've done videos, so. Hey everyone, it's like the the list. We got a whole nother group of people part of the conversation here. But why don't we tell them uh, who you are? We'll start with um, Jeremy um, at Coralines. You gave me this uh, little. Well, I was about the author and outline here, so I thought I would just go off of this. This uh, does a pretty good description of of you who you are, and then we can go and I'll introduce Aaron. I'll reintroduce Aaron. <laughs> Uh, so Jeremy Evans is an avid fisherman and hunter and has been an outdoor enthusiast since uh, a young age. Jeremy lives in Calgary, Alberta with his nature-loving wife and young daughter who skillfully handles a fishing rod like a veteran. In August 2017, at the age of 32 years old, Jeremy endured multiple ferocious attacks by a protective female grizzly bear while hunting in the Alberta wilderness. Jeremy's injuries were massive, his scalp and face destroyed, an eye and his jaw dangling down, and the tendons on one leg had been fully severed during the mulling. His hands were damaged where he had physically fought the bear. It was more than a dozen kilometers to where he had parked his truck in the darkness early that morning, and obviously no one was near. Thoughts of his wife and their eight-month-old daughter consumed Jeremy as he stumbled and crawled for hours back to his truck before driving himself several kilometers to a backcountry lodge for help. All the while, Jeremy thought of his young family and the upcoming six, sixth wedding anniversary that he feared he had, that he might never have been able to celebrate. So that's a pretty good description of uh, what had happened. And um, pretty curious to see, uh, you know, what that story sounds like coming from you. 
because uh, multiple attacks from a grizzly bear, anybody who are, is familiar with this area is, is, I think, got a little bit more respect over what, uh, what kind of power a grizzly bear has. Uh, but I think hopefully coming out of this, a lot of people, whether you're new to the area or maybe a little bit more prone to just kind of being used to that kind of wildlife, have a different perspective of what can possibly happen. So um, glad you're here. Tell your story. And uh, Aaron Mathias, uh, Coralines, uh, co-owner, I believe, aren't you? Correct. Yep. With, with Tim? Tim and Greg. There's three of us. The three of you yep. in Dawson Creek. And um, you introduced me and Jeremy and, and were able to kind of help facilitate and put this together. So for sure. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. We, uh, I got to meet Jeremy through our, our podcast, Hunt Hard Talk Free. Yeah. And that's kind of where it all kicked off through, I want to say it was our Badlands rep and the purchase manager at my Prince George location, who is a friend of, of Jeremy's and the two of them let me know that he had a book coming out and I want to say the Badlands rep posted it on social media. And I reached out to you that within an hour yep. and said, we need you on the show Let's get you on, <laughs> on hard talk free. And he's thinking I'm some whack job way out in left field. Who is this guy reaching out to me? But he was very kind and, and, uh, humored me. And we lined it up for about a week later and, and had him on and kind of got to know him through telling the story. Yeah. It's, and, and, and since then, I mean, we're inseparable. We're attached to the hip, him and I. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, extreme stories, I guess, bring people together. Eh? Exactly. Um, so you're from Calgary, Alberta? Yeah. Southern yeah. Alberta? Born and uh, raised there in Calgary. Okay. And uh, I was looking at uh, where just reading your your book um on google maps i'm just going to bring this up and and i thought maybe it kind of be neat to see where this actually happened oh, you're gonna have to bear with me i'm technically not really that here we go boom share so here's calgary right here so so you want to head up uh, a little bit north to uh sundry okay Tell me when to stop there. Uh, oh, go down a little bit right there to the left and go straight to the rocks. Yeah. And then just mm -hmm. zoom in. Nope. Um, to the first, right, yeah, right in there. Zoom in a bit more. Careful. Don't give away your sheep hunting spots to the. <laughs> well, we, we can do it. That's a good point. We we can do a general area. <laughs> well, where's the lodge? Uh, uh, the lodge? Well, this is the, the Banff uh, National Park. And there's what highway is that? The there? best sheep hunting is in that park. Yeah, of they, course they, it would be. <laughs> so right where you see the zigzag in the road, right uh, here. Yeah. So uh, just on the south side of the river, just head west, and the lodge is basically right, now uh, right around in there. So wow. if you click on satellite view, it actually give you a little bit more. Oh, of, uh, cool. We are going to get detailed here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can show you the sheep hunting spot. There's no sheep there. I haven't shot one there. <laughs> there might be some bears. <laughs> Uh, so right where your mouse is, if you go a little more, uh, Panther River Resort. Actually, it's right on your screen there in the bottom right-hand corner. Yep. This here? That's, so that's the lodge that I went to. Oh. And if you follow that road um, that your mouse is on, yeah, just follow to that south. to the west, southwest. You go, keep going. And it goes around the nice hairpin turn. Yeah. And then keep going. On Looks like the, some switchbacks there. Is that is there a bridge there? Is that crossing? There's is a, that a river or a creek or something? Yeah, yeah. There's a creek down there. It's a very large, steep switchback. Um, okay. If you're, you'll go off the road if you're not paying attention. Oh yeah. Well, switchback. <laughs> very. <laughs> uh, so it's easy to navigate when your eyes are hanging. Uh, yeah, you just feel for the road. You <laughs> feel know? where the ditches are. So, like, you feel the guardrail. <laughs> Uh, so this is the road here, and this must be a little side road. Yeah, that goes up to a, a well head on top of the on top of a mountain. But yeah, if you keep following that trail all the way down, yeah, uh, it keeps on going a bit more. Goes down a big massive hill, Kate. Now from there you uh, head west, so towards you. Yeah, right there at that corner is where uh, I parked my truck. Oh, okay. So that was uh, that's the local spot where everybody parks and goes in. Yeah. Um, there's the gate there, and then uh, if you follow that trail 
all the way in west here yeah still keep going west. keep going west you keep following that trail keeps on going uh down the creek okay uh right where you're at there now head down that drainage to the west oh yeah keep going keep going looks like it kind of came up through here somewhere yeah and keep going more uh just, just keep, keep going and right uh right there in that uh no it's the next one down actually next drainage down right oh too far right there that's where it was holy crap we just figured it out on google map this is amazing <laughs> so for the pure, the people that are listening on the audio they're like what the hell they're gonna fast forward through all this so i'm just gonna zoom out to give us a bit of a reference as to where we are um oh i see so if you were to look at where is that is that water valley water valley straight east from water valley and straight west or west sorry you're right yeah west anyone who was curious on google map was straight west is the area so fairly southern uh alberta which is just north uh west of calgary towards the rocky mountains so that gives a guy at least a mental image of of where this is that's amazing country it's like beautiful. anybody who knows the rockies there is not forgiving country very extreme uh terrain isn't it as far like we we're talking about switchbacks and the trail just to get in there and it's quite a trek just to even look on a, on a map never mind what it would be like if you're on the ground there it's quite the hike in yeah i can imagine so you you what was it from that spot where you showed us uh the the bear you encountered the bear from where he had parked that truck it's about 16 kilometers ish of a walk and that trail is is that uh like a footpath or is it like a quad or so in the beginning of the trail it used to be an old road going into a into a well site and then they closed it down in the i want to say late 80s and um it's pretty well grown in now there's uh the outfitter that hunts out of that area uses a horse and buggy and they go in and set up the camp and the camp uh is about a I don't know, probably five, six kilometers from the where I parked in. Wow. And so, so they they hunt, they sit there. Or that's where their camp is. And they go from there out. And uh, first time I was in there, I ran into them setting up the camp and talked to them. And uh, uh, of course, they wouldn't tell me where the sheep were, but they said you should just go in the back <laughs> there and go look, <laughs> <laughs> go for a walk, go for go a check walk. it out. In other words, scout out the area you want for yourself, kind of thing. Yeah, and so they kind of said, well, we're going to be in this area and this area, and uh, you let us know what area you're going to be in, and we'll keep out of there, and you keep out of our spots. And they're like, sure. Fair enough. It was kind of a kind of a fair deal. Okay. Um, so me and uh, now wife, who's your girlfriend at the time, we, uh, we were um, at the truck loading up our gear, and they were taking their stuff out, and we got on the trail, and um, the uh, outfitter, older guy, and he grabbed my wife's backpack and threw it in the back of the in back of the uh, horse and buggy. And I'm like, what about mine? He goes, well, you're a sheep hunter. You need to toughen up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the other thing I was curious about with terrain like that. You're obviously going in there and this was obviously an area that you already had pre-planned and expecting that if you ended up tagging out, this was going to be something that you were willing to pretty much pack all the way back out to your vehicle. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, from when I got mauled, I hunted there uh, about 17 years in a row. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, I shot a, a bull moose back in where I got mauled by a bear. Um, I shot a little bullwinkle moose. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty cool and ended up spending three, four days hauling that guy out. And Holy smokes. That's a, com that's a commitment, isn't it? Sucker for punishment. <laughs> yeah. It, it was. That big. Yeah, it was. It was, uh, you know, I was pretty excited. You were able to hunt moose in there without a draw. So I went in there and I saw a moose and course of like yeah this is cool so i shot it and they're like well that was kind of dumb but <laughs> <laughs> three days later of uh taking piggyback trips so i'd i'd uh, cut it up into four pieces and uh i would uh hike a quarter out say 100 yards go back get a second piece and then take that 100 yards past the first piece and i just kept piggybacking it oh. and it took a better part of three days to get it out so what do you do when you're going back and forth for each quarter uh, when it comes to scent and maybe attracting predators? Is, do you keep it underwater to keep the scent down and, and cool? Or 
no, I just dropped on the edge of the trail and and away you go. <laughs> away you go. I didn't really think about bears at that time. <laughs> so yeah. let's let's kind of go uh, back a, a little bit to try and I guess set the stage just a little bit. Um, this was something that you had mentioned. You've gone in there quite a few times. So is this an area that you know, and it's an annual trip that you go and you're hunting sheep or was this a draw or, or uh, what were the intentions of you being there? Was it just a fun trip that you wanted to kind of fill out your tag for that year? Or was it, you know, like I said, plan every year? Or? Uh, it was something I uh, was wanted to shoot a sheep when I was in high school. And so when I got out of high school, I kind of looked for an area where there's not a lot of people. And I just put a dot in the map and went and checked out a bunch of spots. And this one here was the, um, kind of close relatively close to where i lived and there's no people there um and it was probably about it was about a 10 kilometer hike into the mountain so i know the average person wasn't going to be in there hunting i wanted to go to a place where i wouldn't see a lot of people so i have i guess a better chance of getting a sheep yeah oh well it makes <laughs> sense but do you normally do you go in with a partner or do um, you go on your own typically i would typically go in with somebody or uh I had a few people I used to hunt, hunt sheep with, but uh, usually about day three, day four, they tap out. Um, oh, it's a little bit too rugged. <laughs> a little bit too rugged. Uh, too far in, by the time you carry all your gear, and then every day you're walking into different mountain passes, yeah. uh, it, it takes a toll on somebody pretty quick. Do you do you prep for it? Like, Do you kind of get in shape uh, or kind of plan for a little bit of a, well, pretty much get in shape. Is there a routine that you do to kind of get psyched out for a trip like that? Yeah, every year I'd probably start around June. Uh, I do a lot more jogging, running, and uh, some weightlifting. Um, mostly carrying a backpack with sandbags and then uh, jogging, jogging with that just to help get in shape. Just for get it. the endurance up there yeah. for sure. Is do you? I read part of the book um, that Aaron had sent me. Well, for some reason. And you're going to obviously clarify, but I thought there was, weren't the initial plans to go in there with a buddy? Yeah. Or, they, or, yeah, yeah. I spent the whole summer and they were doing lots of scouting, found the sheep. And uh, uh, a week before I went in there with a buddy and we are, we made our plan to go hike in there and to look for sheep on the fall on the opening week. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go in the day before, find our rams and then hopefully opening morning, harvest them and then hike out. That was, that was the plan. Uh, but then the day before we left, he got sick and was not able to attend. And so me being stubborn as I am, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going anyways. I'm not giving this up. <laughs> nope. This was, uh, this is my year to get a sheep. I, uh, I spent, like I said, spent all summer in there. I finally found some rams and they're actually hanging out outside of the park. And so I was, I was really excited. Like I, I spent a lot of time and. Have you tagged a ram before? No, not yet. Oh man. So I could see where an opportunity, you weren't going to let it go. That's for sure. <laughs> well, with sheep hunting, they say um, the year you start sheep hunting is the year your sheep is born. So it means you're going to oh, hunt for really? like eight years before yeah. you're successful. That's the rule of thumb. On average. Yeah. Um, wow. And sheep hunting's they call it the 3% club because the less than 3% of hunters are ever successful harvesting a sheep. Yeah, a lot of groundwork it's, going into something like this. And if you don't train, it's, it's, it's tough to be successful when you're up there on the mountain. I mean, being in shape is one thing. Uh, you got to be able to be in shape, be in there, but trying to find a legal ram. I think in Alberta, is a 4% chance of uh, shooting a legal ram. For every ram, I believe there's 60 to 80 hunters for that looking for that oh, one wow. ram. Well, no wonder you made the effort of going into an area where there weren't really too, mu too much for uh, competition. Yeah. And that trapper's cabin was holding the cards close to him, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um what happened that day like how, how did that kind of play out you packed up you already had everything i guess pre-packed the night before and you left did you leave that morning i actually drove? i left the night before so uh i got home from work around four o'clock took a nap and then i usually leave around 11 30 at night and drive out there and this i got out there about a little after three three thirty. Uh, in the afternoon? No, in the morning. Oh, you left home, sorry. Yeah, my yeah, bad. In I left home at 11 p.m. and got in there about uh, yeah, about 3.30 in the morning. Got out, oh, wow. um, got my bicycle out of the truck and uh, got my pack and hopped on that and rode my way in. What were you going to do? You also, you used the bike just throw, when you tag out, you got a bicycle to get back to your truck. 
Yeah. Well, the nice thing is about oh, using smart. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> the nice thing about using a bicycle is when you're going downhill, you can go really quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, when you're going uphill, you take your pack off, put it on your bicycle, and push it up like a cart. But you're coming out loaded downhill, and then you're going back in with your bike empty. Probably not going to go back in with a sheep. No. You no, but no. Hauling that whole thing out in one. But yeah, you go in empty. Yeah. And I mean, he has a awesome spot with uh, a trail that you can ride a bike down because there's for the most part, yeah, right. To where he got mauled because <laughs> that was kind of the end of the the well beaten path right yeah so from the end of the pass to where i got mauled is probably about a uh, two and a half three kilometer stretch of of just game trails really a mm. uh, little bit of a little bit of horse traffic but very little so what's the train like is it is it bed fall um, or is it kind of starting to come out of alpine uh, high elevation or what's it like where you were uh, not, uh, you're pretty high up. You're just kind of coming out of the, out of the trees, uh, kind of in the shorter spruce, more willow, just kind of on the edge, the edge of, uh, where the rocks start. Um, yeah, I guess coming out of the Alpine a little bit, a little bit of grassy slopes and then the trees start getting farther and farther apart. Uh -huh. And there's lots of, lots of willows in that area. Were you, were you packed up fairly heavy? Like this was going to be like a, a week kind of trip or were you going to go in for a day or two and then kind of come back out? No, I, was, some I was planned uh, for a four day hunt, uh, four days of hunting. And then the first day of pre -scaling. So I guess went in for packed in for five days. I oh, bought yeah. a, I don't know, 80 to hundred pound pack. Had my, on my, my tent and sleeping bag, spotting scope. And I probably had just about everything. You're so. geared up pretty decent then. Eh? You're ready for different weather and pretty much the whole go in there for a decent decent amount of time then yeah um i mean at that time of the year in august the temperature is usually warm but i've had it where you'd be sunny in 75 the next day two feet of snow rockies yeah you know, the rockies it's you got to plan for the worst and hope for the best day <laughs> well and i'd say he was geared up better than most people like i would say he was a little crazy to have 100 pounds going into the mountains <laughs> when i go on trips like that i haven't done many but uh my goal is to try and have 50 pounds going in yeah. because you're going to be coming out with a hundred or so or more. If he's by himself, it's going to be more than that. Yeah. So to go in with a hundred, I couldn't imagine coming out of the mountains with a 200 pound pack on my back. Yeah. It's, it's well, the, the man trying to plan, you know, risk versus reward when it comes to packing for planning for everything. But then of course, making sure that you're packing light enough to be able to actually, you know, have what you need, but not too much of it. Yeah. Do you have a, how do you do that? Is that a checklist or you have an idea of what to bring and, and you just put everything in there every time that, you know, is a standard pack for you? Yeah. I kind of had like a checklist, like a, you know, like sparring scope and tripod. Of course I had the biggest sparring scope known to men and the heaviest <laughs> tripod, but they always had to go in. And then uh, like a, I had a, I always carry like a one kg um, jar of peanut butter. That's always nice to have on the mountainside oh. <laughs> for bear. <laughs> Sweet me up a little bit, um, and, you know. And then uh, my wife made me a lunch too, and uh, um, some sandwiches, and they were uh, in a glass Tupperware. <laughs> Just like <laughs> of all the things, it was it was kind of funny. I mean. At least you're yeah. able to look back with humor, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know a place you can get some serious lightweight hunting gear. I'll, I'll hook you up later. <laughs> well, I mean, you did have some pretty decent gear because, uh, you know, I met you just a little while ago at Corlings and you had your pack there and, and a lot of the equipment and clothes that you had at the time of the mulling. You, and that was a decent, that was a Badlands uh, yeah. gear. Like you, it's not bad. You didn't cheap out. You got some nice uh, gear there. That's for sure. Yeah, I had a. I was fully outfitted with Badlands. I had uh, the Badlands Ox Pack with the external frame. Um, they call it. It has a meat shelf on it. Um, very, very great pack. I had it for oh, probably about five, six years at that point, and it could take a lot of weight. I mean, I used it to carry bear bait and my moose out. And yeah. a very good pack. And uh, the Badlands gear, of course, um, top of the line. Um, I've used it in lots of different situations and, you know, down in the desert, Africa and all throughout the Rockies. Oh, wow. You're, you are a no joke hunter. You, you travel, <laughs> you go down to Africa to go hunting and wow. Very experienced then. Obviously it's a passion. I'm a granola muncher. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so this is something you've done your whole life. Yeah. You're was, born and you, you grew up hunting. Yeah. Uh, I grew up uh, sitting between the legs of my dad on the tree stand while he wow. was uh, shooting deer with a bow and arrow. Oh, wow. Well, no wonder it's such a passion for you. It's a part of who, it's almost an identity then, eh? Like, I mean, if you grew up hunting like that. Yeah. Uh, I shot my first uh, first big game animal when I was five years old. It was a mule deer doe. And then I got another one at seven. Five, five years old? Five years you, old. You take no, five. Five years old. <laughs> uh, I used a six millimeter and I shot a, I shot a mule, deer, uh, mule deer doe. How far away? Uh, about 100 yards. Yeah. What took you so at long? At five years old. <laughs> I couldn't carry the gun. <laughs> Jeremy, that's crazy. Wow, yeah. good for you. Yeah. Unreal. I still got the rug. Have you met wallet. anybody else that's been able to tag or do, shoot something at 100 yards at five? Uh, and you want even one, per, one person? <laughs> <laughs> it's impressive. That's pretty cool. That, right on. So, do you do you go hunting with your your kids then too, or like is this something that you wanted to kind of um, instill and experience with them also? Yeah, I do. Uh, I took my, uh, well, I take my daughter a lot. So duck hunting, um, she likes to go and retrieve the duck. She's a, uh, she's a retriever. <laughs> she calls them in and she goes and retrieves them. Uh, my son too, uh, at a very young age, we took him out, got the earplugs, strapped him in and he'd sit there in his, uh, in his little carrier and we'd go hunt ducks and geese and, um, they helped me set up the decoys and, uh, well, my daughter likes to put them in little family groups with a bigger one and then surround them <laughs> with all the babies, the ducks. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, I, I enjoy it. I like to do a lot more hunting with them and, uh, you know, carrying them around and it's, it's fun. For everything that is said about hunting, uh, it probably has, I think the most understanding of nature as general, not that, that's, I think encompassing not only the wildlife, but terrain. Um, and the reason I wanted to kind of ask some of those questions is because a lot of times people take for granted, I think a sense of just um, awareness surrounding uh, what you're looking for. You know, this wasn't, I think, that happened because of a lack of understanding. You weren't going out in the middle of nowhere that needed, you know, search and rescue to come out because of a lack of um, skill or planning, or you know, experience. or experience, uh, quite obviously. Uh, people are very quick to try and you know, just say, well, you know, who was this guy anyways, <laughs> right? And and so it puts things into perspective, uh, especially for, we were going back to like what we are saying earlier, a lot of the people up here, we take things like that for granted because you're in it quite, quite often. And when you are that passionate about it, to be able to want to share that experience with, with your offspring, your kids, much like how your father had done with you, um, it, it's people shouldn't just shrug it off as I think a lack of um, just being naive, right? That's definitely not where we're talking about when, when you had this experience, uh, you put a pin drop in the mountains that very other few people from what you were just telling me, even are daring to go in there <laughs> and join you for an experience like that. Eh? Uh, out of all the years I've hunted in there, I've maybe seen one or two people in there that far back in. Well, not, where i'm at but uh little le not as far back in but uh, only one or two people i've seen i've actually never seen anybody uh come to where my sheep camp was or or have any sign of anybody being in there um it's usually the only one what do you classify as a, a sheep camp like is that an actual area that you've you've kind of uh, built a shelter for uh no i carried in a picnic table and set it up in there and uh dug a hole in the ground. I uh, buried a uh, 45 gallon drum to put my food in there. So during the oh. summer I'd hike in there and take canned food and, uh, like a cash. Yeah. And buried in there. And you know, the only problem is when you do that, you got to make sure you're right on there with felt pen. Cause the labels don't stay on. So you're kinda <laughs> musical. <laughs> so <laughs> musical we should food. go back to that map and show everybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's a cash here. <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, the one day the elephant was like, who's the idiot that carried a picnic table back there? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you're the first one I've heard talk about taking a bike. It's smart. It's a very, uh, you hear of people taking canoes to try and get downstream close to the foothills, but a bike is actually a pretty ingenious way of going about it. So what kind of bike is it? Is it a mountain bike? Or? Yeah, I just got a... a um, 
really a little basic hardtail mountain bike with the uh, it's called a rock hopper um yeah just a standard el cheapo rock hopper yeah, it's not those rock, ones rock they hopper. they jump like on obstacles you can jump up onto a bench and kind of bunny hop and go from one obstacle to another is it no it's a uh, just a regular hardtail mountain bike uh, made for climbing hills okay it's more of Fair a enough. yeah lightweight hill climbing mountain bike yeah Okay, so the day of you you get in there. Um, you said you arrived. You 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 parked your truck around eleven o'clock. You you said roughly. I left my house around eleven o'clock and parked the truck at uh, three thirty a.m. Oh, in the morning. In the morning, uh, hopped on the bike and uh, rode in on you know, with the moonlight. Uh, wow. You know, it was it was fairly bright out, uh, clear sky, and rode my bike in. And closer, I guess about three quarters of the way in, uh, there's the trail kind of goes up uh up the hill up a hill and uh i remember uh riding my bike and looking out on the one side and there's uh two cowboys sitting around a fire right at the crack of dawn looked like they were uh you know getting their coffee and one guy had like a big lanny mcdonald mustache and nice. he's looking at me <laughs> drinking his coffee and as i'm riding my bike past their camp up the hill and they're just shaking their heads Damn uh, city boy. And yeah. Bike. Yeah. <laughs> Who, who's this guy on the bike, right? He's a great big pack and hear him just like pedaling by wearing, <laughs> I was wearing uh, like blaze orange shorts and, uh, and a maroon shirt and this huge pack and uh, had a full face helmet on. Like I was ready for war and <laughs> just, and they're just looking at me, sipping their coffee. Like who's this guy? Um, yeah. So I rode past him about another, I guess probably another hour or so until I got to the end of the trail. And then at the end of the trail, uh, the road just literally just dead ends at a drainage. Then you got to walk down the drainage and get into the trees and um, a little bit of a horse trail. And then it kind of slowly fades out. And you get to the next drainage, uh, the trail kind of thins out and just more of a game trail. And so when I got to that point, it was uh, light enough out that you could see quite a ways in. Um, I guess how you can describe it, it was like there's shadows on the on the hillside. It's a perfect time to spot sheep or spot animals moving because you can see the shadow makes them, you know, longer, a little bit easier to see. So I was taking my time. I'd go down the drainage, come up the other side, and I'm just getting to the edge of the tree. So, you know, you walk uh, three, four feet, sit there and look for 10 minutes and go another three, four feet, keep looking, keep looking. And uh, I was working my way up into the back, uh, into the back bowl towards where my camp was. And, you know, I just 10 feet at a time and look, and I spotted some sheep and I was like, oh, it's pretty exciting. I'm like, oh, this is great. Um, and I remember I wanted to stop to eat, but I was too excited. There were sheep there. So I had to keep, you know, you keep, keep an eye on them, keep an eye on them. Is there any rams in there? You know, is that, is that the ones I'm looking for? And I just slowly move my way along the edge of the tree line and making sure that they don't see me and vice versa. And, um, how far were these? Like when you spotted them, were they in the distance quite a ways or you were, you were concerned that they might sense you there? Uh, they were about, uh, I'd say about five to 700 yards away. Oh, they are pretty close. Yeah. Wow. So they were fairly close. So I just, uh, cause where the, where my camp is, you got to go across a couple open spots on the mountainside. Um, it gets to a pretty tight drainage. So I kind of want to make sure see where they were going to go first and then kind of make my way out of their way and set up camp and uh you know hopefully sit on them for the day and harvest one the next morning yeah that was kind of my plan so i had all the time in the world to get in there and set up so i wasn't too worried about time i was more worried about where are they going to go and didn't want them to see me i guess yeah yeah get an idea of exactly where they were going to bed down for the day yeah so before i let you continue on with these with these sheep um i'm a little bit more of the novice um, when, when it comes to this level uh, of, and technical hunting. Um, but from my understanding, the sheep typically will um, usually travel between a, a cycle of a day between bedding down and where they typically feed. And, and if you can figure out where they bed down and feed, that's going to allow you to kind of predict where they might be because they've got a bit of a, a pattern in their in their uh, day-to-day um you know, routines is that is that accurate or is there any truth to that uh they do have their patterns like if you see a sheep in that in that bowl uh today then next year around the same time there's gonna be sheep in that area so they're kind of very um i don't know what's the word to use um 
Well, they stick to one area. It's not like mm-hmm. once you kind of figure out where they are, there was going to be a chance they wouldn't be there the following day for you to be able to go and harvest. So there's quite a bit of value in figuring out kind of where these things were hanging out. They can just disappear the next day. Yeah. They might not come back there for a couple of days, but you, they are predictable that when you find a spot that has quite often they like a mineral, mineral lick. And they want to come back for those minerals. So again, if you see sheep in there today, you know, that's yeah. a spot that sheep will be back. Now okay. it might not be tomorrow or it could be every day. They, they yeah. just hang out in there if they've got a good safe place to bed down because they're very sketchy creatures when it comes to predators and they want to be above and where they can see Looking down. anything coming up. Right. Okay. So, yeah, like sheep really freak out when you're above them. When you get above a sheep, they just go nuts. They don't like it at all. They like to be the highest thing on the mountains. So. Uh, out of their comfort zone. Yeah. It's yeah. the best way to come out of them though, too. <laughs> it is. Because <laughs> they're not looking up. They're looking down. Yeah. And it's the hardest to see them, too, because when you're on top of a mountain trying to look down, you can't necessarily see what's below you. It, it's tough. It's uh... So your vantage point right now was over and slightly down. I was more... Level with them. They oh, okay. Were, they were kind of right across on the other side of the valley from me. Um, so I was, they were a little bit higher than me in elevation, but not much. I was pretty much looking straight across the, the uh, drainage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> Technical sheep hunting right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I, I was watching the sheep and uh, I was like, oh, there's, a, there's some young rams in there. I'm like, oh, that's got to be the group that I've been watching all summer long. And I was getting pretty excited. So I was sitting there watching them, um, you know, I was, uh, took off my backpack and leaning against my bike and I had my elbows on the handlebars and I was sitting there watching these sheep and I'm like, oh, it's really cool and getting excited. And, uh, you know, I brought my binoculars down to reposition. And when I did that, I noticed this little brown thing run in front of me there. And I, I knew right away what it was. Like I knew right away it was a bear, like just, I just knew, um, so I saw her run in front. I'm like, oh shit. It's just one of those moments where you just, you, you know, something bad's going to happen, you know? Um, so it ran in front and then I'm like, oh crap. So, uh, reaching down in my backpack and, you know, dumb me, I put my bear spray in the bottom of my backpack this morning. I was too lazy to strap it to my chest. Murphy's and, law. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> threw in the backpack, whatever was the chances of me seeing the bear. Right. Um, so I was reaching in my backpack to, uh, grab my bear spray. And as I'm reaching down, I heard, a a branch break behind me. And I turned my, as I was turning my head, caught the glimpse of, uh, of mama. She was, uh, less than an arm's reach away, a length away. And, uh, she had her front paw stretched out. And I remember just seeing the whites of her eyes on the one side and like kind of her eyes rolled back and, uh, uh, her mouth was open. Um, she was on a full charge running in. So what I did was I grabbed my bicycle, my right hand and grabbed the frame and I just dropped it in front of her and stepped aside. Uh, her head went right through the frame of the bicycle and uh, she picked her head up and of course, you know, the bike's like a necklace on her and um, she shook it off and, and uh, I grabbed my pack by the frame and I had the, the part that goes against your back was facing, facing her. And first thing I did was she came to bite me and I shoved it right in her face and then uh, picked the pack up and started beating her over the head um, with, with your pack, with my pack. And Chris has got the, it's the ox pack with the metal side. So I was trying to hit her in the head with that and push her back. Uh, as I was doing that, she uh, first grabbed my hand against the pack and crushed my hand uh, against the frame of the pack. And so I got my hand free and she grabbed the other side. And anyways, we we're uh, stand off for, you know, 15, 20 seconds or so. So you were on your feet at at that at this yeah. point still you you were able to kind of lean into it and and almost like you were grappling like a shield. yeah <laughs> using like a shield oh um yeah I just you know pushing her back trying hitting her in the head and uh, and the power like it's just with a bike around with your bike around its neck at this point and you're pushing it back with your backpack <laughs> well <laughs> yeah it didn't really feel the power of her. like she was kind of almost like she was hesitant she wasn't like super aggressive like it yeah. just um you know she it was kind of like a like a standoff there and then she turned and started backing away and so i was i was backing up she was going the other way back into the drainage so i was backing up to get out of there and as i'm doing that i'm trying to get uh, my gun off the back of the pack or grab my bear spray and i looked down tried to unbuckle it and my gun and then i looked up and she turned right around and she come right back towards me um 
she was coming a little a little faster this time. Um, definitely had like a um, determination in her eye. Like she looked like she was she was coming to get me. Uh, and so I just panicked and I, she was probably about, you know, a couple of feet away. I threw the pack at her uh, and then just ditched the, threw it at her and ran up the hillside. Um, I probably had about 60, 60 yards or so up the hillside. And uh, what I was trying to do is trying to run up the hill um, so I can jump off the hillside into a tree to get, get faster height. I mean, that was my grand idea. There, there weren't a lot of trees where you were at and you're kind of on a little bit of a, a hill yeah about a 35 degree, degree 40 degree slope oh, uh, so it's fairly steep where where you were fairly steep and there's trees you know every uh six to ten feet apart so not a lot of trees and not very big trees um so i found a tree that i thought was a fairly large tall tree so i grabbed a tree and jumped into it i got about uh about five six feet up um my right leg was hanging low um i had like uh, when I jumped across, it was a spruce tree, and I had my left leg was on a branch, and I was pulling my pushing myself up, and right leg just was, scramble the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, pretty quick, and yeah, uh, I just remember you can hear the huff of the bear, like <laughs> you just you can just hear it, like pounding on the ground when it was running behind me. Um, you could definitely tell it was coming. Yeah, and uh, you know, I climbed up a tree, and I'm pulling myself up, and I'm looking down, and I can see my right leg's kind of hanging lower, and she uh, was right there at the bottom of the tree. She stood up. And she reached up with her paws, just reached up and just wrapped her paws around my right leg and just pulled it down, pulled it right into her mouth. Wow. And I just remember looking down and I could see her teeth and her mouth open up. I'm like, this is going to hurt. <laughs> and then I just, her just sunk her jaws right around my leg and knee and just, <laughs> you can feel it. And, you know, and, and it, around your knee. So right your whole leg was in its mouth. Yeah. So her uh, mouth was behind uh, the, the in the back of my knee and her teeth are wrapped around to the front that's a big bite holy crap yeah so i'm looking down you know you see her and going around and i can just see her closing her jaws and i can just see her teeth sinking in and i'm looking at going like this is gonna hurt and <laughs> i didn't feel anything and then she just fucked her head off and i just poof, i went flying out of the tree uh it hit the ground pretty hard and it was a little dazed but uh, i scrambled underneath the spruce tree and tried wrapping around the spruce tree just trying to get around the base of it and hold on and uh, i figured the spruce brows would protect me from her um so she was clawing at me and uh, she seemed to be kind of frustrated with it she's trying to get at me and it was only getting the branches and then uh she stopped and she just reached in with her mouth um and grabbed me by the uh left side uh kind of in like the love handles and she picked me up and threw me about six feet. She just grabbed me, picked me up, and shook her head. And I was flying. Plucked you right out of the spruce. Just like like nothing. I mean, the amount of power. And she just, like, one little bite and just clunk, clunk. Wow. Um, so she, hit, she wasn't a big bear either, like, mm -hmm. as far as grizzly bears go. No, she wasn't uh, an average-sized female, so around the 300, 350-pound mark. Uh, you know, nothing huge. Um. And she picked me up and threw me. When I hit the ground, it was days like, wow, like what's going on? Um, it was literally a half a second later, she was on top of me, like literally just, just super quick, uh, lightning speed. And, you know, I'm laying there, curled up in a ball on my right side. And of course, thinking going through your head is play dead, right? Um, That's what they keep telling people to do. <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> I'm curled up in a ball, trying to protect myself. And, she came right in, and I remember I watched her. I mean, my eyes were wide open, and she her first bite caught me right on the corner of the uh, left eye. Uh, her one of her canines came in um, right at the corner where your tear duct is, and uh, one canine was there, one canine was on the other side of my eye, and she crunched down all the way down to my jaw. It was the first bite, and I remember laying there, and I could just. You can just feel the bones in your face crush and crack. And I mean, like the popping inside your head is super loud. Um, and I didn't really feel it, just more you can pressure, just, like more felt like pressure more than anything else. Yeah, kind of like going to the dentist and how they work on your teeth, you could feel yeah. them. It just kind of felt like that, but you can just hear everything cracking and popping, and it just so loud. Um, and I was like, wow, this sucks. Um, you know, it's really hard to lay still and something's chewing on you. <laughs> like 
going to say. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard just to lay, like everyone tells you to play dead, but it's really hard to play dead when something's turned on your face, right? Well, when you're, did it kind of, I mean, it happens so quick, but something like that, I'm sure would have kind of paralyzed you. Like, I'm sure you were wanting to do something, but were you still trying to fight back or was this just something where it's just happening so fast that the experience of it was just kind of leading from one moment to the next? It, it happened so quick. So uh, when she tossed me and it hit the ground until she was on top of me, it was probably half a second. And then they're just right away, bang. So I guess within three seconds of me hitting the ground, she already took a bite on my face. Wow. Uh, you know, and it, you, what do you do, right? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't either. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> I never experienced this before. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so what I, so what I did was, uh, you know, I, she bit me and I kind of rolled over and I, I was like, this sucks. So I started punching her in the face and sticking my fingers in her nose and poking her eye. And as I was, you know, I grabbed her corner of her nose and tried to peel it on the side and she was snapping at my hand and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, her eye was right there. So I tried poking that she pulled her head away and snap at my hands. And, um, I mean, she got kind of, it looked like I was like aggravating her, like, you know, poking her ear and eye and nose. And, uh, then she come down to bite me again. And I, it just was like a perfect moment. Her mouth was wide open. She's coming down and it was like a, a, a sweet moment. Like, you know, like, Anyways, her mouth wide open and I... A sweet woman. Like, this was something you can see because you're the side of your... But, Jody, I'm, I'm good. But this, it, it took a, a a bite on you, but you still had... You are aware of what was going on and vision out of your other eye? Yeah. The, yeah. The other side of your face? Yeah, both eyes were pretty good uh, at this point. Um, the left eye, yeah, was a little damaged, but you can still, I can still see pretty good with my right. Yeah. And... Just like it was a perfect moment because her, the way her head was um, coming down and with her mouth open, it was like in line with my left arm to punch in, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna moment of opportunity. Yeah, I was like, I'm gonna punch her, and then it just, oh, and I went to go punch her. I it went, I punched my fist right into her mouth, and I just remember um, feeling her tongue and just sliding my fingers down her tongue. You could feel like it felt like uh, soft leather at first like car seat leather almost. And then you could feel the bumps on her tongue and you could feel like the ridge on the center and then like all the little scars. Like it's a very, wow. I, it still haunts me today, that feeling. It just, I just remember feeling it and you get down and I could feel the back of her, her mouth, her throat. And um, I had my index and middle finger kind of stuck down her throat and I used my thumb, pinky and ring finger and it kind of wrapped around her tongue and held on. And, um, when I did that, she kind of like gagged and was like making like a choking and, a kind of, a almost like a pig squeal, like a really deep, you could tell. And she was like, uh, mostly gagging, gagging and probably a little bit of shock and pain all in one. Whereas, yeah, or yeah, more like shock. She just, it just, she didn't. I don't know if she knew what to do. She's kind of probably shocked. Like, What's this? <laughs> Never had that happen yeah. before. I mean, yeah, it's, like that. Or it didn't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't shove its leg down her throat. <laughs> so how far, like, you were up to your elbow? Uh, well, no. Uh, I just remember when my hand was in her mouth and, you know, laying down looking at her, her nose was uh, about three quarters of the way down to my elbow. Wow. Uh, and so I just remember like seeing like her lips and her nose right there. And I'm like, Oh wow. Like, I mean, I'm in there deep. <laughs> um, is that I, what you're thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yes. totally. <laughs> this is so cool. You know, you, you only do this one, twice, right? Is anyone filming this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, my hands in there and, and uh, she's like choking, gagging. She's standing over, over top of me like her uh front legs were on my left side i'm laying on my back at this point her front legs are on my left side and her uh back legs were digging in my right side and i just remember feeling her claws like pinching in and it was hurting so i was trying to you know my hand in her in her mouth holding her tongue and i'm pushing on her hind quarters trying to get her legs off of me and of course i mean no matter what i can do i, I can't move her and she just wouldn't budge um and then my hand just it slipped and it hit something soft and it could tell it was the belly. There's like no hair and it's like a thin spot. Yeah. And so like, Oh sweet. You know, like this is, and then I reached up and, um, 
I grabbed something very fleshy and I thought it was balls at the time. So I grabbed it and just got a big handful and twisted and pulled. And when I did that, she made a horrible sound, sound like a pig, real deep, deep squeal of a pig. And uh, she was like choking and um, kind of heaving and squealing like a pig all at the same time. And I just remember the the smell of her breath is just like a horrible, like wet dog, um, rotten kind of smell and yeah, hot breath. Just, yeah, like it, it just was like, ugh. Um, and I just remember her her shoulder was rubbing against my face and just the smell of the, like the fur and just not a pleasant smell. <laughs> I um, believe you. <laughs> so soft <laughs> and uh, and whenever i had it i was it definitely was causing her pain um and uh she was very excited and trying to get away and i let go and she and she took off um she ran kind of up the mountain and back into the back into the uh back bowl and so Immediately after she got out, I got up and I dusted myself off. I'm like, well, that sucked. Uh, walked over to my backpack, got my backpack, flipped it open. And I'm like, well, you know, my hands are kind of messed up here. And I pulled out my cell phone and turned it on uh, selfie mode. And I was like, oh, let's see how pretty I look, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I popped it out. I'm looking at it. Oh, okay. So I'm taking the picture. And that's the picture in the book there. And um, I remember sitting there looking at it going, well, um, is this is this uh i can still go over there and shoot that sheep or i can go and hunt that bear so <laughs> that's a memory you had thinking of just the shock hey eh, of of that I, I don't know necessarily i probably was in shock but it was more of just me sitting there just like this sucks like this is <laughs> this is my year to shoot a sheep and he's over there and you know i'm so close and this stupid bear and just trying to figure a work around yeah uh, on on after being uh, mauled a little bit. <laughs> I was just thinking, you know, maybe I was wrap my shirt around my head and uh, I'd be good to go, right? Like, you know, let's go and shoot that cheap and let's get out of here. The pain hadn't kicked in because the adrenaline was still pumping so hard. Yeah, I didn't really feel anything. It just, it just like, I was just looking at it like, oh, wow. My modeling career's over, but I can harvest that ram. That's right. <laughs> if I could just get that ram, this will all be yeah, worth it. This will be worth it, right? You get that cheap there, you know? Like, a ram and me, that'd be cool. <laughs> well, it... it Anybody who's been in, I think, a very intense, uh, ex extreme situation like that usually do have thoughts that are what we would consider to be odd, but it's the rationale and, and the thought process. You are in shock, and obviously that was something that was paramount for you being out there. It's funny that that's kind of something that you remember thinking, <laughs> and it was bad enough to take a picture, but you're like, I can... I can do this. I mean, you're, that's a whole nother level of, of crazy tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this picture for the audience at home that you took of yourself is not for the faint of heart. I mean, it is the epitome of, of gore on the internet. Um, and when you looked at that and thought, I can still do this. Uh, this hunt is still possible. Is there, the brain. is there a picture that we can see on? Yeah. If you're on social media, well, yeah. you can dig it up on his social media or on yeah. the core lanes one. We, we've got, We've got it on both. And I mean, okay. Facebook blocks it out until you click on it because well, of the... Level. Maybe what we'll do is I'll, I'll let you continue with the uh, the story. You can do but it I'll, yeah, in, yeah, like in a little bit here, I'll yeah. kind of, you know, find a moment to take a look at that picture. I, I do have a question for you, though. Rewinding back to the time when you're sitting on your bike glassing, do you think that the bears were there when you rode your bike in and stopped? Like, did you come into them or did they come up onto you to get started? What... How do you think that played out? Well, I think uh, they were in the back bowl there. There was a, a very large berry patch that uh, I knew of that I used to go and eat lots. And so I think they were in there. And um, just because of the way I was going in, uh, you know, like the four or five feet at a time, stop, look, and uh, we had no clue. Maybe if I was going in there faster, I probably would made a lot of noise and they would have heard me and took off. But I think just because I was, very quiet, kind of slowly moving my way in. They had no clue, and I had no clue they were there. So you 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 came up without them. You startled them. You pretty much. No, I don't think I necessarily startled them. What uh, what I think happened was uh, the way the trail goes down in uh, down into the drainage, and it kind of turns up, goes up the hill, and uh, or up the mountain, and cuts across the side. I think the bears are in that berry patch, and they're coming down the trail um early morning you know, probably heading back or going to get water and 
um, the cub was in front and she come running down the trail and passed me and mama, you know, trailing behind being slow. Oh, I see. So the cub got passed and the wind was blowing up the drainage. And so where she was coming from, she was coming from the downwind side of me. So probably she come around the corner of the trail and she's her cub and she could smell me. She just full panic mode. I'm gotcha. Got between yeah. them. So I think they were just moving down. And they weren't expecting to come across you. Yeah, I did. No. Nope. Ninja your way. So in. <laughs> in, in, in the um, outline here, it said there were multiple attacks. So the first one was where it came on top of you and plucked you out of the tree. No, I uh, kind of, the uh, way I look at it is uh, the first interaction. So with my backpack, me being over my backpack, I call that round one. Gotcha. And then round mm -hmm. two is the tree. And then, uh, well, we haven't gotten to round three yet, but um, oh, <laughs> from the tree till oh. now is round two. Yeah. Oh it boy, round two. Okay, place. round two is where the picture is so, taken. Uh, we're not done. No. Nope. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. And so you look at the the state of his face after round two, and it gets worse. So do you have a picture of that? Yes. Do you? Yes. After round three. Yes. So should we maybe wow. look at this picture uh, now, and then you can. So as a reference, um, I don't have that picture with me. We, uh, that one's really bad. Um, yeah. I have those in that file that I just don't, it's pretty, it's not, it doesn't need to exist. Fair enough. Yeah. It's, it doesn't it's need a, to be brought into light. Yeah. Yeah. So the Fair picture enough. that you put in the book is after the second round. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll take a picture. We'll take a look at that after then. So, so at this point. So I didn't, re I, I obviously didn't read that well enough because I thought when it had bit down on your face, that was pretty much where it had had enough and, and you scared it away or you pretty much were able to fend yourself off to the best you could. And, and, you know, by sticking your arms down his throat. <laughs> so, um, so after that, you know, I got, took the picture and I'm, and I'm sitting there. I, I got my pack leaning up against old rotten stump on the trail there and, Leaning against that and had my backpack and uh, I was going through it looking for, you know, uh, um, bandages and whatnot and just um, didn't know what to do. I grabbed my gun and uh, sitting there, had the gun against my shoulder, uh, leaning against my left shoulder and I had my clip in my hand and I was sticking rounds in thinking, man, that stupid bear, like, what do you do, right? So I'm loading up my gun and as I'm uh, loading up the clip, I just remember hearing the sound of... Uh, like ice breaking and it was very loud and I could feel something like pressure in the back of my head and back of my neck. Um, she had come back and she grabbed me by the back of the head, uh, kind of base of the skull and the neck. And I just remember she bit down and you hear the ice, everything like things breaking. And, um, that's when I dropped the clip and my hands and arms just kind of went limp. Um, so she grabbed me by the back and, uh, she was dragging me into the bush. Uh, I just, she had her claws, we were digging in the ground and I can hear her just like, just like huffing and, and dragging me. And I can just feel myself getting pulled across. Um, she had me at the back of the head and I, I, you know, I don't recall how far, but it felt like a little ways as she pulled me in. And uh, I was uh, sitting on my butt, legs stretched out in front of me. When she stopped, I was in an upright position leaning against her front leg um and she reached over with her claw and grabbed me on the right side my face caught me kind of on the corner of the mouth uh, on the right side and nose and her claws went rip right through my eye and all the way down the right side of my head uh kind of like pulling off my ear and all the skin and um just like one big swipe and then uh she then was uh Sorry, yeah. she then was holding my head and she was chewing on the back of it like a like a just like a dog chewing on a bone, just kind of gnawing on it. And you just hear it and things like cracking. You feel her teeth scraping or hear her teeth scraping across the skull, and yeah. uh, she's ripping and tearing and pulling. Um, she was chewing on my left side, my neck, by my ear, and just ripping all that out. And I just couldn't do anything. I couldn't really feel anything. Couldn't move my arms. Nothing. And she just was just going to town. Uh, and she must have shifted or moved her body, and I fell uh, against the ground. Um, 
And I remember like I hit the ground and it just felt like an energizing moment. Like everything just got reconnected and I could move my arms and it just was like, it was a weird feeling. Uh, so anyways, um, I hit the ground and uh, I remember I couldn't really see at this point. Uh, everything was really fuzzy and you just see like dark and like fuzz. And um, I could tell she was up, standing above me and I could feel her belly and her hair and my face. And um, so she was at this point standing over me and I just instinctively just reached up and I could feel the softness of her belly. And I'm like, oh, wicked. So I reached up and grabbed what I thought was balls again with both hands and i grabbed as hard as i could and i pulled myself up kind of like doing the chin up and then i wrapped my legs around her head and neck and just kind of locked them in and um sitting there holding on and just whatever i had i was trying to rip off and she was rolling around bucking like a bronco rolling around on the mountainside and just squealing um like a deep deep squeal and I remember she was defecating at the same time as this was happening. Mm. Just you smell. Anyways, uh, she was rolling around and just jumping. I'm hanging on for dear life. Um, and then I could tell her she was running in, uh, or moving in one direction. Like she wasn't, she was like trying to run away. And I let go and she just, she kept going. Um, I was just landing on the ground and I just, I didn't know where it was. Well, I kind of knew where it was on the hillside. Um, a little disoriented. I crawled down the hill and I managed to find the trail right away. And I crawled down and found my pack. And when I got to my pack, I was feeling around to find my gun. Like I couldn't see. Um, at this point in time, my left eye was hanging out of the socket, hanging down. In order for me to look forward, I had to like pick up my eye and, and hold it up or tilt my head back. I didn't think I had a right eye. I couldn't feel it, couldn't find it, um, couldn't see. Uh, anyways, I was reaching around and I found my gun right away and I was panicking. I wanted to find the clip so I can, you know, put the bullets in it because I couldn't see down the tube and my fingers were all going different directions. And um, as I was feeling around for the clip, I uh, found my mustache and goatee. Wow. Uh, and then I found a, my ear and a couple chunks of my head. Um, so I was kind of putting them in my hand and, uh, and then I found the clip and the first thing I did is slammed it in the gun and fired three rounds at the first dark thing that was, that I seen or could kind of make out. <laughs> um, and then I, uh, you know, was sitting there and I had all the pieces and I'm just looking at them. Um, you know, I can hardly tell what they are, but I just sitting there and just like, what do you do? There's blood dripping all over, pouring all over the place. And, this is probably the, I guess, the lowest point in my life. I just didn't know um, what to do. Uh, like, you know, you're not going to survive this. And it was, it was, uh, it was a tough moment. Um, I'm sitting the, there. The sense, the, the sense that there must have been still at that point in time, just self-evaluation as far as figuring out exactly the extent of the injuries that you had. Like, did you know when you're finding these pieces of your, you know, what you mentioned your 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 beard and parts of your ear and your nose. Did you know they were missing, or was it just in that mulling? You felt pressure, but you didn't really have an understanding of exactly what was happening. I didn't. I guess I didn't really know what she's pulling off. I just you can just feel pressure and things, yeah. and hear it kind of ripping. But I didn't. I didn't know. Um, I guess until I had it in my hand, what was really coming off. <laughs> Um, and then exactly what might have been missing like it, it, it's just almost kind of fluke that you were able to find all this stuff without having really understanding of the extent of your injuries and the ability to even see and and have an idea of where you were and where everything else was if you're feeling around like i remember one of the pieces i grabbed i was feeling it and you could feel like the hair it was like my uh like my eyebrow and skin i could just tell i can just feel with my finger like wow like I knew what it was. It just, it was kind of creepy, I guess. And you could feel the ridges of like the ear and, oh. um, yeah. So I, I had all these pieces there and I had my, I pulled my phone out and, uh, I started to text my wife, um, you know, bunch of things like that. I miss her and that I screwed up and that I'm going to miss her and the monster, my daughter. And, uh, it was really hard cause I just, it was just hard. I just, what this is like, what do you do? You're, um, 
you know, you're obviously not going to make it out. You're, I'm bleeding all over the place. There's things missing. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I know, you know, I can't stand. Um, it was tough. So, um, they're sitting there thinking like, do I just end it or do I just lay here? And like, what do I do? Right. Take matters in my own hands. Or- Processing what was going on and how you're going to end up managing that situation. You probably were wondering what the extent was, but you knew it was obviously I knew really it was bad. bad. Yeah. And then of course, I'm sure there was something in the back of your mind of what if this bear comes back again, or was that even a thought? I don't think that was a, a thought at that time. Uh, I think it was more of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. And this is, mm. you know, the thoughts, the, the million thoughts that race through your mind, you know, like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go fishing again. I won't be able to take, walk my daughter down the aisle and she gets married. Won't see her graduate. Um, you know, won't see the grandkids, you know, it's just the, the things that run through your head so rapidly. It just, it's so many things that, you know, come up. Um, and, uh, you know, when you're just, what do you do? Do you let things happen naturally or do you just, finish it and yeah. end the suffering so um like i said this is probably one of my darkest moments and uh i i decided that i was just going to end it um so i grabbed my rifle and i threw a shell in there and i cocked it put it underneath my chin pulled the trigger and it didn't go off um it was i guess kind of a relief but not uh and then when i moved it away and rechambered it it went off and that kind of scared me i guess um Wow. Yeah. So it didn't go off and then it misfired when you're going to put another round into the chamber. Yeah. So like the, I don't know if I didn't put a shell in there or didn't the hammer didn't get already cocked. I don't know what happened. I, I didn't, I never really thought twice about it. Yeah. I just, that was just kind of a, you know, it's a hard thing to, to talk about or to admit like that's one of the biggest things I struggle with, with this whole process is, um, you know, coming up with the book and that is to actually admit that I just, it's just hard. Um, we, you know, we had kind of touched on it and I, I, I think it's still worth saying that, you know, when you're in a moment like that, uh, I don't think anyone's immune to having thoughts, uh, of like, of, of specifically that. Um, and it's not, I think, I think the, the hard part, and I'm interpreting this, um, you know, as far as I thinking of course, why it's hard to explain because, uh, you know that the shame in that is is you know perceived as weakness, but I mean there's a lot that goes into it, and when you decide not to, uh, we were talking about earlier where everybody talks about being you know tough and up and strength and everything else, but mental strength is I think very under it's it's underestimated, and those are very valid thoughts. I don't think having that that honesty. To be able to, you know, express exactly what it was like at that moment is, I think, the realization of how severe it was and where you were at that point in time. And I think anybody that was in an, who would experience that and be in that position, um, I think they'd be a liar if they said they didn't think about those exact same thoughts. As graphic as the attacks were in the book this one short paragraph is probably the thing that stuck with me the most when I read it. And uh, it's a very short part of the book, but I had to stop and reread it. And it, it hit me hard. And and, and again, I've, I've thought about it a lot since too. And not only the attack, but then the, at this stage, there's no hope. There's nobody nearby. He's in the middle of nowhere. There's no, there's no SOS button. He didn't have an in reach that he could SOS. I'm hurt come get me like there's i am so screwed i'm so far <laughs> in the middle of nowhere there you're what 14 or 17 kilometers from your pickup yeah about yeah about that in the middle of nowhere where nobody's at where nobody's at <laughs> and where nobody <laughs> normally goes yeah and you're in a position where i mean it could be at that time moments of how, who, how long are you going to be able to survive yeah. before you know how long do i have to endure this pain exactly because yeah. i'm uh, li- like you said if you thought about hiking out to the truck you never would have made it no no it, it was too far too far it didn't even, didn't even cross my mind um i knew i wasn't going to make it i knew i knew 
sitting there that I wasn't going to make it. It was either going to happen there or a hundred yards from there. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm sitting there and I wanted to, I knew I wasn't going to make it and I wanted to try to document as much as I could. So I let my wife know that I just didn't give up that I actually, I tried. Um, so I took one of my sweatshirts I had and I, uh, put it on upside down, put the neck piece on and folded the, uh, the shirt open and I stuck all the pieces of my face and stuff on the shirt, kind of try to put them layer them, uh, blood to blood, just hopefully to keep them alive. I don't know where I got that from. I just kind of, I don't it know. makes sense. Instinct. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and you, you pretty much when the bear, um, had, you know, scalped him, scalped him. Yeah. That's exactly what, happen it was your your was fully scalp was yeah they call it fully degloves uh so all the skin from the back of my neck uh kind of where my spine hits the skull all that was peeled off my head and um, my left jaw left side of my jaw was hanging down and yeah there's no skin on my face it was all kind of hanging down um parts ripped off and all the way down to my left collarbone everything was and all your exposed. eye left eye was hanging was out of the hanging. socket yeah um hanging out busted out and kind of hanging And you can down. see through it still. I could, yeah. It was kind of creepy. Like kind of like a kid's cartoon. Yeah, they have like the eye in their real. hand and that's what it kind of felt like. It <laughs> so was, was there, um, like were you blink, uh, like when you talk like that, my eyes are watering, I want to blink. <laughs> like were there um, automatic uh, body functions that, that were happening? Were you blinking a lot or like, did, were you eyelids. trying? There, there was an eyelids at that point. There, there was were, no eyelids. Were gone. <laughs> like there was just, it was just skull and looked like somebody took a ball peen hammer and smashed me over yeah. the forehead and all over the face with the ball peen hammer. Yeah. Like it just, it wasn't a pretty scene. No. Um, and so I guess, and, and not to get technical, but I'm thinking the exact same thing is if my eyes are open too long, my eyes are driving me exactly. nuts. And in that situation, yeah. when you have, let's, you weren't planning on making it all the way out, but you think how many hours you had to hike out. How do your eyes stay moist? Exactly. Right? And, and it's a weird thing to discuss and to, and to think about, but hold your eyeball. I mean, at some point, and I know this is probably, you were in shock. So the pain wasn't there, but eventually, you know, over, I don't know, at some period of time, the pain and sensitivity and ability to be able to just have the agility and function like you were at that time, you know, being able to place some of these parts uh, and, and see are going to start to be compromised. And, and that pain now is going to start to override the ability to ha have any kind of rational thought. Like it's just going to end up being, unless I'm wrong, I don't know. <laughs> I was pretty calm. Like I was fully aware of the situation. I, you know, I didn't really feel any pain. Um, I was pretty calm. Like I wasn't freaking out or panicking. I was, I don't know. I was able to keep pretty myself pretty calm, pretty like I wasn't breathing deep or heavy. It was just normal. Like, yeah. all right, what's next? Um, and so I, I mean, I was feeling around my face. I could feel my jaw hanging down. Like all my teeth on the left side were all exposed. And, um, I, uh, you know, threw the pieces on my head, folded the shirt up, and then I uh, tied, it was a long sleeve shirt, I tied the sleeves underneath my chin, kind of pushed my jaw up and tied it tight underneath my chin, and then I tied two knots in the back really tight just to hold my head straight. Um, and uh, I hope I was going through my backpack looking for, you know, a first day, uh, my first aid kit, which I found, and of course I opened it up and they had like little tiny, like, you know, four inch by four inch band-aids and <laughs> yeah. yeah, I need a couple more of those, but <laughs> there was nothing in there to use. Uh, I mean, I bought one of these advanced outdoor camping family kits and I was just like, there's nothing in here that I could use. So I was like throwing pieces all side the mountainside. And um, at this point too, I was, I don't know, I was so hungry and so, I was so hungry and I had this pack of uh, Swedish berries in my backpack. I bought this, like this mega, this mega pack. And, and I always loved eating those on the mountainside. So I had this and I was so hungry and I just wanted to eat them. And I tried to open up the bag, but my hands are so messed up and I got the bag open and it ripped open. And there was, they just like all over the mountain exploded, <laughs> kind of exploded. <laughs> so I remember picking some of them up. I had in my hand and I was trying to eat them, but I couldn't move my jaw. Like it was just hanging there and, um, so I was putting them in the side 
uh, kind of, I don't know, kind of in my cheek where my jaw usually is and pushing them in there, sitting them on my tongue and on the back of my throat and just letting them kind of dissolve and run in. And, um, and I was just sitting like, well, I, I, at least I owe it to my wife to, uh, at least make it to some place where they're going to find me quicker. Cause where I was, no one really goes like maybe one or two people a year go back in there. So uh, my, I was just thinking, well, maybe if I get a little bit further down the trail where somebody's going to come across me and I was more worried about my wife, um, not being able to, they're not being able to find me right away and mm -hmm. her having to worry. And, you know, I just, I wanted to make it where somebody's going to find, find me, find my body. A little quicker for sure. Yeah. And, and so, um, after I had a few Swedish berries, I grabbed my water bottle and I threw, uh, a couple sweaters uh over top of my shoulders i was wearing shorts and a t-shirt and uh you know it was 9 36 a.m when uh, when uh, we first made contact and so it's probably closer to 10 o'clock now and uh, being in the mountains up that high you get sunburned pretty quick so i was more worried about getting sunburned and drained uh so i was going to cover myself with to protect myself so i, I can make it a little bit further out of there <laughs> um and so uh, I was sitting there, you know, and, and I can't really see, but I knew which way to go. And, uh, I tried to stand up and I, and I couldn't, uh, it was all, all the strength I could, I couldn't get up. Um, the first 10 feet, I probably fell a, a hundred times. Like it was just stand up, fall over, stand up, fall over all the, my whole right leg, uh, just to couldn't put any weight on it. It just, I just buckled and I'd fall. Uh, when I did get to stand, I got to a point where I could kind of stand and, um, I would basically drag my foot. Um, the first part of the trail is, uh, goes down a steep drainage. Um, you down said, to a you creek. said it was about a 35 degree incline on the hill here still that, that yeah. you're at. Were you able to, like when you're trying to stand, uh, had, did you find use your pack or anything to help support your body weight, like a, a crutch or a cane or something? I was using my rifle. I had my rifle oh, in my hand okay. and I was trying to use that. And, um, and for some reason I had uh, like a box of ammo there, lots of rounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, or five, yeah. five boxes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah five, bo yeah. And At a least pack of light for the 40 to hunt. 50 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> 40, 50 <laughs> rounds. <laughs> I'm one of those people that, uh, you know, use their backpack, don't quite clean it out and you can never find your shells. So you go and buy more. And, <laughs> and then next thing you know, you find, find them uh, in a situation like this. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, perfect. You know, now I got these rounds. So I can send lots of SOSs yeah. off, right? No. Um, <laughs> pretty much everything I seen that was dark or looked dark, got three bullets. It didn't matter what it was. I mean, I, well, I didn't know what it was, but if it was dark looking, you got three bullets. So you're using your gun as a crutch to be able to kind of walk down this trail your pack you just left behind yeah i just said, screw the pack screw the bike i don't need and you it. just had uh some rounds and that was pretty much it you're wearing a t-shirt and and whatever and you're just trying to make your way back to as far down the trail as you can to be able to be found sooner yeah and, and so the in the first uh, 100 yards it just goes down a really steep uh down in the drainage and i remember I got to, I got started going down the trail and, you know, it's, it's pretty steep. Um, I lost my footing and I tumbled probably 300 feet or so down the trail, down the drainage into, uh, the bigger boulders down to a Creek. And I remember just, I tumbled into that and I hit there and that's when things really hurt. Um, I was completely mangled up and I could hardly move. Uh, it just, everything hurt at that point. Um, I had all I can do just to kind of roll sideways just to get some relief, like kind of like knock the wind out of me. And it just, I guess it's like feeling being in a, a wash machine and just bouncing around. And um, I remember laying on the rocks there and I was, I was pretty mangled. Um, I mean, I was in a lot of pain and I, uh, I just, I gave up and I was laying there and um, I just, I couldn't continue on. Like I was just so exhausted. So yeah. hurt. And I pulled my phone out and I was uh, going to play some music and just fall asleep. Uh, so I pulled my phone out and of course I can't see and good thing with the iPhone, they got all the fancy colored icons. So I was clicking around and um, managed to get the, the music app up and, and I hit to play some music and the uh, 
song that come on was uh was baby shark mm -hmm. and so uh you know, we used to play baby shark from my daughter when uh she was sick or um couldn't sleep at night we'd play that and i would soothe her and so so here i'm laying in the rocks and got my iphone out and um song comes on baby shark do 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I think after like the third song, I just after the third time, it, it was on repeat. I just I couldn't take it off repeat, and it just it would play. You let it go. I just let it go. Uh, <clears> I like, oh. I, uh, I I actually I've never heard of that song until I read it in in your book, and and you know I've got kids and grandkids, so I looked it up, um, and I I was like I don't know I, I was I I can play it, but I was like I don't know if that's a dick thing to do or but I, do you mind if I play it or go for it? Okay. <laughs> just the, for the listener because i was like man i've never what's this baby shark thing <laughs> not a trigger nope no well, okay. it was but it's we're, you, we're good okay we're good i'm gonna share the screen now boom and then we're gonna bring it over to here uh oh there's lots of different versions oh. of it what's happening here why is this not working Please, please pray. Oh, there you go. Daddy shark, do 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 Daddy shark, do 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 Daddy shark. Okay, so that was playing over and over. It's catchy, As but I boss. feel like that would probably drive you nuts. As a with young kids, I'm not very happy that you just put it back in my head because <laughs> it'll be there for the next seven days. <laughs> oh man! So you had that on repeat? <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, and I don't know what. Uh, I mean, the song brings back uh, lots of lots of memories and. I don't know if it was the fact that the song playing on repeat got, wanted me to get out of there or, you know, or the thought of uh, seeing my kids again and my daughter again. And, um, it was motivation. Yeah, I'm going to say it was more of the motivational side of things. Um, so I I couldn't stand. I was mangled up in the big boulders and I just uh, kind of knew what direction I needed to go. And so I started crawling up the uh, drainage on the other side and got to the trail and I remember crawling through the like the short little junipers and the spruce trees and the deadfall. And I just crawled in a straight line down the, across the mountainside. And I got to a point where it was where the trail was. It was a little more uh, kind of, I guess, a little flatter. I was able to get back up and drag my right leg and get through the trees. And um, But there's uh, – there was a trail my object was to get to the next trail that went up over to a, a drainage or a bowl and behind and i was just um, i was just trying to get to there because that's where some people go more people go there and i was trying to get to that trail uh because where i was was kind of uh you know a game trail and very few people so i got to that spot and i was like okay this is good now let me get a little bit further down let me get to the next drainage where uh, a lot more people go um, or to where they just bump in the goalpost, eh? Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, okay, well, that's only another, um, you know, let's go another 10 feet. Like there's a, there's a log over there. Let's get to that log, right? Yeah. That's Cause I mean, there's a good spot to sit. Um, and it just making those little, just setting those little tiny mini goals. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you're working, okay, I got to there. Now I can get to the next tree or, you know, a little bit further down. So I got to the uh, the last drainage before the main trail, and I got to that one, and I was okay, awesome. So now I'm here. Now I got to get through the drainage and get to where the kind of where the road ends. I call it. It's like the end of the road. Um, and I was just trying to I get to there because a lot of people go to that at, at the end of the trail there and sit there and look for sheep. So I have very high chance someone's going to find me there. So I was just trying to get to there. Well, I get to the next drainage and it's just as steep as the last one. Of course, I tumbled down it and mm -hmm. um, crawled across and got up to the main trail. And I remember I, I, it was a big spruce tree there, kind of where the two, uh, the goat trail I'm on and the road ends. And 
I remember crawling up through the junipers next to that big spruce tree, and I got to that trail, and I was, I was, I was happy because I knew there somebody would find me within a day or so. Like, how, how far? What what's the distance here to put things in in perspective up to that point? Uh, from where I got mauled, this is probably around the two kilometer mark. Man, where were these uh, cowboys that you had mentioned earlier that you'd passed on the? They're probably from this point uh, another two to three kilometers away from where I was to go still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and we're talking army crawling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And exactly. Zombie leg dragging. If that, yeah. It used to, to be like more like a zombie. Yeah. yeah. More like, uh, <laughs> yeah. That, Cause that leg doesn't work. You got, no. Your tendons don't work around that knee. So you got to drag, basically drag it. Yeah. And uh, okay. Yeah. I'm glad. So Aaron, I mean, these are good things to be bringing up because uh, the, the, how severe your injuries were you're bleeding um your, your armor crawling through you know some very extreme terrain steep enough to where you're you're falling down into creek beds and whatnot um was there a, a change in the way you were feeling were you getting nauseous where was there a sense of um was the shock starting to wear off a little bit at this point or i was extremely exhausted i just was just so tired it just I don't know, it's so hard to describe, like, but just absolutely ran ragged. Just like I, I could have just stopped and fell asleep. Like I was just so tired, so exhausted at this point. Um, just yeah, it's a weird question, but when you're falling and you're going through some of this stuff, um, was there a lot of mud and debris and twigs and, and brush? Uh, getting impacted into some of your wounds and your injuries that that were starting to maybe become problematic or or a concern of any kind, like especially you know with your eye, you know, there. <laughs> um, I don't didn't really particularly care, but uh, I had like spruce needles and branches and leaves stuck to my face from falling and um, from what uh, the ladies that helped me out at Panther River there they uh, they had. Uh, I remember them talking about all the sticks and needles and crap stuck to my yeah. skull and face. Um, and, and these pieces that you had put on the top of your head, was that being kept in place still? You had a knot and, and your shirt was holding your jaw and everything yeah, somewhat in place? So like the body part of the shirt, I put everything inside and I folded the shirt down around my neck and then tied the uh right. tied it underneath my chin and then the sleeves underneath my chin and on the back so that was you all... did a pretty good job man like i gotta say like for <laughs> i don't think i can do that on the best of days <laughs> well <laughs> then... at all like i mean your hands the dexterity uh that you're able to what you accomplished like it there's was... it's worth taking a moment of pause just to say okay that is in itself a tremendous feat i mean it, you're accomplishing a lot it was hard to do like it was it was a challenge um but i mean i the reason why i tied underneath my jogs my jaw was hanging down and when you're walking it's just like hitting you in the chest and it just it's annoying <laughs> like it just it's annoying. like it's just it, it was just there and so i just put it underneath <laughs> yeah <I'm, laughs> stupid jaw <laughs> and i, I remember it's off my chest again <laughs> like yeah it just like it's just like god oh, stop it like this is like just irritating so i i tied it in place really uh i guess with baby say. shark Playing in the background stuff. Yeah, you know, crawl into the bush, <laughs> listen to Baby Shark. Um, you know, that probably kept the bear away. <laughs> you know, it's it's humorous, but wow, it's, uh, it's pretty wild. And speaking of kept the bear away, I got to say, if I was trying to think about the perfect sweet treat to bring bears in, it would be Swedish berries that you had a kilogram of on your trip. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Well, the, flavor, it had to been the sugar, right? That yeah. was keeping you going and you were injecting <laughs> energy into the bloodstream. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a little good. bit, not much, but is there. Man, those tasted good that day. I will say. <laughs> those tasted really good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even still this day, every time I go hunting, all my buddies that come with me, they bring a pack of Swedish berries and they just leave it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and when I was walking out, I had a piece of my face that was hanging down and it was dangling and i actually at one point in time was thinking about getting my knife and cutting it off because it's just hanging there and it just it was driving me nuts so i had to like try to tuck it in somewhere and it just like what do you do like this is oh this is attached to me okay let's tuck it in the shirt or something and it um you know it's just the weird things that drive you nuts when yeah. you're missing your face i don't know it's just <laughs> 
I mean, of all things, I'm more concerned. I about... love the humor. Like, I mean, talk about making light of a situation. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's just just the little things that you just. Yeah, I mean, my, I'm looking at my hand and like my finger, my uh, um, pinky was like completely sideways, and you're just looking at like, well, that's kind of weird. Like you're just pulling on it, and just no, well, there's nothing there, and um, just the like the weird stuff. It of all things. Um, so I, when I got to that main trail, I was like, okay, well, I made it this far. Let's get down um, another hundred yards down the trail where it splits, and so. If I get to the split, well, there's a lot of people that go to there and they go either the one pass or the pass that I'm in. And um, everybody went to the other pass because I guess there's probably sheep there. And <laughs> so, <laughs> none in the one you've been back to. No, nope, no, years. there's n- no sheep in there. No yeah. people. So, obviously, no sheep. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was just like, okay, I'm going to make it down to there. And I just remember um, walking on the trail. This part of the trail, there's lots of uh, little saplings poplar saplings all the way along and um that's where i normally see the bears and i just remember walking through there and um you know like holding on to the little trees and trying to get down the trail and not fall over and um just kind of slowly make my way around the edge of the mountain um and i got around to where the trail splits and i was like oh i'm here okay Awesome. Like, I made it this far. So like, no, I mean, there's a lot of higher chance of somebody finding me. And, um, so the tra- trail splits, uh, split, sorry, but I was just going back to when we we're looking on Google map, that's about halfway. It looked like, wasn't it? Like you're no, starting this, to make this decent... was, uh, about a third of the way, maybe yeah, oh, about okay. a third, uh, well, a little over a quarter closer. To you're the making some decent. So what period of time did it take you to do this? Cause you said it's shocking how accurate you, you, you could uh your memory was as far as timing and you know uh, spatial awareness of where you were and i think you mentioned it was around 9 30 10 9 36 a.m 9 36 <laughs> a.m and <laughs> at this point now you're this is an hour or two three into the day like you're hitting about noonish or so yeah this would be uh pretty close to noon okay it was pretty close to noon um i remember uh, this part was in the small sapling, so there was, you know, late August, so leaves are still on the trees, and it's kind of like the shady part. And you come around a, a corner, and it gets kind of open. And I remember feeling the heat, uh, and like you can just feel how warm it is. And um, when I got around that corner, I, uh, I had like I threw a couple sweatshirts over top of my shoulders just to keep the uh, me from getting sunburned. And yeah, I was more worried about well, getting sunburned. It's, it's August. It's hot, and our days are extremely long in this country. I mean, we've got maybe what five hours of darkness, six hours of darkness. Yeah, maybe. Here in the bush, there's mosquitoes. It's muggy. Yeah, I, I just, I just remember Bugs. coming around, and I could feel the heat, and uh, and the trees kind of open up, and then it goes more into more dense, older spruce. And I got to that point and I took one of my sweat, uh, shirts off. I just had draped over my shoulders and I hung it in the tree there, um, kind of in the middle of the trail so that someone would see it. And uh, I just, I got to the, the the older spruce and I was working my way through there and I was thinking, well, I know those cowboys are are kind of down in this area where their camp was. So let's try to get to yeah. Them and hopefully they're still there having their coffee. Right? I mean, I know this is like lunchtime, but maybe they'd be eating lunch. Absolutely. Uh, so I remember walking down the trail and um, I couldn't talk. I can only like kind of moan or make weird noises and you know, my jaws hanging there. And um, I remember I turned sideways and was kind of shuffling down the trail, uh, trying to look into the trees on that one side of the trail to see if I can spot their tent or see them. And I, and I remember just kind of shuffling down the trail and I got to that spot where I was pretty sure the camp was, but there was nothing there. I, I couldn't see anything there. And I was, uh, you know, trying to make noise. And, um, I fired a couple of rounds of the gun off, uh, up in the air and nothing. I couldn't hear horses. I couldn't hear nothing. Mm-hmm. And there was nobody there. And I was, I was devastated. I was like, well, this sucks. Like, I mean, I wanted somebody to be there. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. Another, I think, morale hit. 
obviously huge, yeah. huge. This was like, oh, you know, like those are the guys that could find me and you know, and um, so that that, that sucked. And and they weren't even coming back at this point. Like they had packed up camp. Yeah, they, there was no, yeah, there was no tent, no nothing there, no no sign of them being there. Um, I mean, I know I couldn't see very well, but I I didn't. There was nothing there. Yeah. Um, actually, I kind of their campsites like three feet off the trail or five feet off the trail. So, I mean, there was nothing there. Um, and I was shuffling along. There's a uh, quite a steep, uh, there's a Creek that cuts through there and it's about a 10 foot drop. And I remember I got to the edge of that and, um, I was like, how am I going to get down this? Well, I found an easy way. I just fell down it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> gravity. I, this is gravity. Yeah. Like, let's just give her, right? So I, I fell down and, and, and I landed right face first into the creek and my face was in the water. And um, I was just, I was so tired. And I hit and then face underneath the water and it's hard to, you know, breathe and move. And I just, I crawled through it, got all the, out of the creek and up the other side of the, of the creek and it was pretty steep you know about a five six foot and i remember crawling up and there was a little sapling there and i pulled myself on that and i managed to stand back up again and um this was it was i don't just remember that spot and getting up there and um i was able to i guess get enough strength to, to stand and keep going and uh another i was probably at this point it was it was about halfway, I want to say, to my truck. Okay. At another kilometer, kilometer half to go until I got to the outfitter tent where, you know, they're always, they've been, they always set up there in early August and they're there all the time. Like every time I've been by there, they were there. But this morning, actually, I didn't see them when I went in. Um, So I got up and started walking through the rest of the spruce and it gets to the, uh, the creek uh, or the North Spring Timber Creek there and uh since the flood we had uh, quite a few years ago um the trail's all blown out at that point it's just you walk down the creek and it's all uh washed rock everywhere and lots of deadfall and there was no trail so i had at that point i had to just kind of follow the creek down and uh meet up with the other trail and right where the creek and the other trail is that's where the outfitters usually have their camp set up where that's what they always have the camp set up. So. And that's what you had pointed out when we we're looking at the map earlier. Yeah. Okay. And it sounds like these moments that you're going through were just little areas of where um, you had to kind of work through something, whether it was lack of energy, maybe it was a mental block, but there was a, a, a moment that you had to kind of struggle and then continue on. And the next you got yourself kind of recomposed and then refocused on your next goal. Yeah. And and now this was the lodge. We, you know, we, we the, the cowboys are gone. You made yourself back up, you know, that embankment. And that was okay. Let's hopefully this law, there's some people at this lodge. Yeah. Uh, well, at the, it was the outfitters tent there. Um, so the next set of obstacles was uh, walking down the, the creek. And of course, it's all washed out. There's all this deadfall everywhere. And you get to, uh, you know, uh, a piece of deadfall and like do you walk around it or do you step over it you know and then sometimes you get in a big like a big log jam and yeah. you get a bunch of logs climb over so it was just trying when you get to those because i couldn't see very far do i just go over it or do i risk keep, having to go all the way all around the way this around thing. right and so each time i came to a piece it's like okay like trying to feel is this like is this the thin part of the tree like the top or is this the bottom we got to walk around the root ball <coughs> And so uh, it, that was a hard, you know, it was hard to decide. And so I just kind of meandered my way down, following the creek. And I got to kind of a familiar spot that I, that were, uh, were a familiar spot where the trail used to be. And I knew the uh, outfitter's tent was right there uh, in that spot. So I ended up kind of walking through some willow brush on, on along there. And I come to the uh, electric fence of the outfitter's tent and, uh, mm -hmm felt my way around and uh found where it opened up and i opened up the fence and there is set up is uh i think the two two big canvas tents and one's like their food tent one's their sleep quarters so score yeah i was oh, starting to feel pretty here, good right? here <laughs> yeah when i got into the fence so i couldn't 
I couldn't see any horses or couldn't hear any horses or anybody. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe they're out hunting and, um, you know, maybe there's a radio or a sat phone sitting inside the tent. So I opened the first tent, you know, trying to feel around, got the zipper open, opened up and there was nobody in there and I couldn't see a phone or radio. So then I went right directly to the second tent and it opened it up and it, uh, that one was pretty, it was like empty. There was nothing in there. And so I'm like, okay, well, I went back to the first tent and they had a, great big uh, plywood, like a four by four plywood cabinet. And they had a lock on there or a, I don't know, like a little handle thing. And I, a latch, a latch yeah. and I couldn't get it open. And I was just like, oh, screw it. So I put my hand on it and I knocked it down on the ground and it hit the ground and it broke open and there was all these canned food rolling around. <laughs> and, and inside there was a little black case and uh, it was like a, like a perfect size case for, like the old sat phones or like the old mic phones, radios. Yeah. And like, oh, there's a phone, there's a phone, yes. Or, you know, and I opened it up and it ended up being uh, uh, a pocket knife. So I was kind of, that sucked. So, <laughs> and, and I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm feeling around and uh, the cans are, and there's all these cans rolling across the floor. And uh, I remember the one can, I recognized what it was. It was uh, like a triangle shape, like, the, like a can of ham. Oh, okay. Yeah. Spam. Spam, yeah. <laughs> How are you going to get into that? Well, you know, that, that, <laughs> that's the case. Yeah, see, I made it this far. Right? <laughs> Not like you can gnaw on it. I mean, <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> so I got this, like, triangle-shaped can, and I knew exactly what it was. It was, like, you know, ham. And so I got the little tea thing that you got to stick in the can. And oh, turn. yeah. Yeah, well, good it's luck with that when, you, when your fingers don't work. <laughs> So I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, this is pointless. So I'm trying to get into it. And I just grab another can and rocks are beating up. Finally, I got the corner of it opened up and peeled it open. And I remember just sticking my fingers in that. You got ham. it beat. You got that thing open just by beating the hell out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just impressed. It. I'm, I'm, wow. When, when I'm going to try that the next time. <laughs> when you're that hungry and determined, <laughs> <laughs> like it's got the little tab that you got to pull up to oh, get it started. They're throwaway. I don't know why they have, have, I never usually get those things to work. Yeah. Well, I remember looking at it like, well, how do I get my finger? Like it just doesn't, nothing works. So I just started beating on it with another can and had it. I like, I had a can sitting there, put it on top and I was beating it with another can. And, um, cause there's no chance I was going to open up like a regular can. Right. <laughs> so how did you be able to shoot? Like, did you just take pieces of this? And so I, I peeled it open and just like grabbed a chunk of it. And just shoved it in the corner of my mouth and just let it like kind of roll down my throat or just kind of, I was Slide mashing up with my tongue to my roof of my mouth, trying to squish the juices out of it. Yeah. And I just remember like, oh, it was so good. Like it just, it tasted so good. And I mean, you just, that's one of the things you want to do is eat ham and listen to baby shark, right? <laughs> it's a holiday right there for me. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know. Canned ham and baby shark. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, they had a Christmas is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Should we play that again? <laughs> you guys have any spam? Uh, yeah. You know, oh yeah. man, we might actually. Yeah, Jody's over there. Yeah. We really want to get in the moment. We can. We can do that. <laughs> so the uh, so they had a picnic table. So I'm sitting at the picnic table and I got my my fancy can of ham and um, I'm sitting there eating it and I just remember sitting there and he just like the blood dripping just drip drip and i was just it was irritating so i started trying to wipe it off because it's just you know it was bothering me of all things and and i just kept like oh well this like like <laughs> well, i want to stop right and then i uh, was looking around on the table and there was some bounty sheets I'm like okay well i'm going to fix this so i started wrapping around my head and ran oh, out. Wow. and then i found some to and then i was sitting there eating and then it's still dripping i'm like well where's it dripping from now oh my hand so i started wrapping my hands up and and I found a roll of toilet paper and I just started wrapping my face and everything up until it, uh, it stopped. And while I was wrapping it, my jaw was being irritating and hanging down. So I, I uh, pushed, kind of grabbed my jaw and just kind of pushed it up so I can wrap it. And as I was doing that, it clicked and I'm like, Ooh, that felt good. And, uh, and I was like, like oh. testing, testing, like I could, like it just, I don't know if it was dislocated or something, but it just, it kind of snapped in and it was like a relief and I could kind of talk while well, I could talk at that point. I was like, Oh, okay. Well, that's good. And I couldn't still couldn't really open my mouth, but you know, all my, the whole, still the whole side and my cheek and everything was gone. So, um, and then, uh, 
as I was sitting there, there was a, a roll of like this white tape, it looked like uh, athletics tape. And so I grabbed that out and just to tape the toilet paper in place and bounty sheets because they were falling off and that was irritating. So I taped it in place. <laughs> Uh, and then my hands, I had holes in my hands. And I remember looking at my hands, you could see right through them. Uh, it was like a golf ball size hole in my uh, right hand and my left hand. There's my pinky finger was, um, the bone was sticking out and pieces everywhere. And uh, so I wrapped them up with uh, tape to cover the holes. And, and then I continued. Pretty much you were able to patch yourself up a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Just enough just to stop the blood from dripping everywhere and making a mess. Pretty much. <laughs> and I was sitting there finally able to enjoy a, and so that some place with, that you pretty much found this ham must have been just completely destroyed like a bear had been in there. <laughs> it was quite a mess I, I felt kind of bad so uh and I was you sitting, felt bad I felt bad well I mean you know like this here's some guy comes in their camp knocks the breaks their cabinet you know eats their food and bleeds all over the place but yeah you're not, very sure. inconsiderate yeah I mean it's just it's not a good thing to do right I mean, so, so Canadian sorry guys sorry <laughs> exactly I'm so when I, when I was digging around, I found some juice boxes and they had like a couple of little Tetra packs. So when I was like, oh yes. Score. So, so I, you know, trying to, trying to get the straw off and well, that didn't work. So you just squeeze it enough and it like popped the corner and you can squirt in my mouth and they tasted so good. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm in there and one of the things I did when I first got in there, when I was sitting down at the table, I got my phone out and I have a, when I was doing interval training, I have like a little timer app and you just hit it and it just had the timer go and it just, uh, for 30 seconds it ring and then and then recount and go again and um i i brought that out and i was hitting it because i didn't want to fall asleep so that was now where the fatigue was starting to kick into where it was a concern yeah i was very exhausted but you had i think uh new you, was there any hope like were you now starting to kind of, that goal post was kind of actually starting to get a little bit further out were you starting to get a little bit more optimistic about really what the game plan was no i i was kind of going downhill at that point um i was just so tired and exhausted uh i actually when i was sitting there i got uh, a sleeping bag i rolled grabbed a sleeping bag and i rolled it out on the floor cleaned out some of the cans of the air and rolled it out on the floor opened it up and these outfitters are uh their camp is always set up uh, their fire their stove has always got wood in it and in kindling and everything all ready to go all you gotta do is just light it yeah and i remember i opened it up and feeling in there oh it's already ready to go and i was gonna light a fire and just um keep warm and and fall asleep i just i was so tired it's just extremely exhausted so um i remember sitting there looking at the fireplace and you know got sleep big rolled out and uh i just didn't know what to do. Um, one, one of those moments that you had to kind of grapple a little bit with. Yeah. And, and I, uh, I remember I found some paper sitting on the table in a Sharpie and I, uh, I was kind of writing a goodbye note to my wife. But, uh, that's where in I, uh, one side of the note I wrote to the outfitter, you know, like, sorry, I messed up your camp and this is who I am. And, uh, on the back side, it was more like a, a goodbye to my wife. Uh, cause I, I was really going to give up at that point too. It was tough. Um, so I wrote on it and then, uh, I remember I emptied out my pockets and there was, three shells left so i got outside the tent and i fired the last three rounds off and i grabbed the uh last tetra pack of uh five juice boxes and there's about five miles from here to the truck so i figured heck i got enough energy for every mile you and made a decision juice box yeah and i fired off last three rounds and so the, that was a sign of commitment to your your decision yeah i was thinking you know maybe the guys are coming into camp. Maybe they had to go for something and they're coming in that day. So I figured I better get down the trail. Maybe they'll find me. And I, you know, I still wasn't thinking I was going to make it. Um, so I left a note on the table, put my gun next to it. Um, I left the tent. I closed it up and, uh, 
you are got to be the politest guy. <laughs> My goodness. Zip it <laughs> I, zipped, I zipped it up and uh, they had like four chairs out front and I sat in one for a minute there. And uh, of course it was all bloody and I tried wiping it off. And <laughs> um, and so uh, I zipped up the tent and I, when I left their camp, they have electric fence up. So I hooked the fence back up. And then uh, started hiking down the trail and, you know, I had my juice boxes. I was all happy, like kid in the candy store. And I got these nice fancy, I think they're grape. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I left the camp and I pop one open and I'm just trying to squirt in my mouth as I'm walking. And the trail kind of is pretty flat and zigzags through, uh, crosses the creek, I don't know, probably half a dozen times. And uh, all along the way, you know, about every, I don't know, half hour or so, I'd or 15 minutes, I'd pop a juice box and start drinking it. And uh, so the trail crosses the creek one last time, and it gets to there's a base of a hill there, and it's a really steep, nasty hill. And uh, the first thing you do when you get onto that or hike into that area, the first thing you do is climb this stupid hill and go down it. And, uh, and you knew where you were, I knew where I was, and uh, I had a choice to make either I can walk down the creek, down you know, another four three to four kilometers to where the road crosses and then walk down the road to my truck or cut up through the bush uh, to my truck. Like, I've never done it before, but I, have, you know, I kind of know where, where I'm at and if I could do it or I could just walk up the hill, uh, the really steep, stupid hill and, uh, and go up that way. And I was just thinking like, well, I'm not going to make it. So I better stick to the trail because somebody will find me there. Hmm. And so I, you know, sucked back a juice box and uh, started making my way up the hill. And I just remember looking at my feet and just kind of shuffling along up the hill. And at this point in time, my right leg was pretty much seized straight, so completely useless. But at least I can put weight on it because it was just solid straight. Um, so I was working my way up this hill and uh, I come across these two rocks. They're a little bit bigger than a... About I guess twice the size of a shoebox or so, and they're right in the middle of the trail, and they have like really no significant. They're they're always there, and every time I ride my bike in, I'd hit the rocks and almost fall over, and you just want to like I I was always <laughs> too lazy to move them, so they were like three quarters of the way, almost to the top of the hill, and I remember just walking, and I see the rocks, and I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna make it! Like at that point when I saw those rocks, I knew where I was. I knew I'm almost at the top of the hill. And it's only a mile from here to my truck. I'm I'm going to make it. Like I, I at that point I knew, and I was so happy. And then much to my surprise, I had a juice box. I had one left, and I was like, oh! so I popped it open and I sucked it back right there quick. And I kissed my hand and touched the each rock. You know, like oh, thank you. You know, and uh, I knew I was going to make it. And I, you know, I got over the top of the hill and went down the other side, and. Uh, you know, it's pretty straight and flat to where the truck is, but well, there was a gate across the road, so no one can, you so can't drive in there. And so I got to the gate, you know, thinking you're, you're going to make it out. And I had a, a couple of decisions to make. I can go on the right side and go like 30 feet and walk through a little bit of a swamp and come back to the trail. Or I can go to the left and walk, you know, 100 feet around the gate and get back to the road. And this is one of those gates where instead of just a, a gate that swings in like two pieces of pipe, it's an actual solid uh, gate that's got... No, no, it was like you swing in like pieces of pipe. Oh, okay. So you couldn't go underneath it? Well, see, that that was the thing. So, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so uh, I could, you know, I go around the left side and it's a nice easy walk, but it's like 80 feet one way and 80 feet back. Where the other side, 30 feet through a swamp and 30 feet back, right? So... You know, the choice is obvious, right? I'm going to do the smart thing and go underneath. <laughs> so um, that was probably the dumbest thing I did the whole way. Uh, when I tucked underneath the gate, I started to lose consciousness. I started to oh. um, kind of pass out. And there was a, a road sign there that has like the holes drilled into it. Like a, it's like a... Oh, it's... Um, like an L bracket with the holes. Yeah. Like a like huge... Angle iron kind of... Yeah, and it's uh, galvanized. Side. Yes, yeah. and, and it's got the holes in it. Yeah, and so I, I was passing out, and I was like just losing all my strength. And I jammed my fingers into the holes and grabbed on for dear life. And I was holding on to it, and I just was all wobbly, and I couldn't stand up, and I just was like blacking out. And I remember just holding on to this thing for dear life because if I fell over, I, I mean, I'd probably have been done for. 
And uh, it took probably about 10 minutes or more for me to kind of gain consciousness enough strength so I can stand up. And I, I stood up and I was like, that was the dumbest thing ever. Like, why didn't I just walk around it? Man, I would have done the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so now, you know, here I'm still doing the zombie walk, listening to the baby shark as I'm getting uh, to my truck and I get up to my truck. And the first thing I did was I had my hands in front of my face and I pushed the, the uh, side mirror out of the way. And I opened up my uh, truck door drawer and I hopped in and, put the keys in ignition and I fired it up and I remember sitting there looking out the front of the truck over the hood. And I just, I, I couldn't see the end of the hood. Like it just, everything was all blurry and I couldn't see. And then I rolled down the window and I looked out the window and uh, I couldn't see the ground. I couldn't tell where the ground was. And I was like, well, this sucks. Like, what, what do you do? Right. And so and the area I was in is all spruce trees on our side of the road. And so it's all like dirt green. And there's like a light strip through the middle, which uh, I assumed was the center of the road. And so I just aimed for the light spot and I started to drive, hoping to find somebody. During these switchbacks that we were talking about earlier with guardrails and narrow, steep grades. Yeah. And my um, goodness. There, were you able to see through your other eye? I didn't. Uh, I didn't think I had a right eye. I couldn't so find my right eye. So this was all still with your eye that was hanging. Yeah. And how many kilometers was oh. it from where the truck was parked to the um, the resort? Uh, no, twenty ish, twenty two, eighteen to twenty kilometers. Looking on that map, it looked like it was quite a ways. Yeah, it was, it's, a, it's quite a ways. What a half hour drive. You know, I just I'm going to bring that map up again, just kind of reference because now that we've heard your story, it's going to I think give us a. A different perspective i think appreciation for the distance because was a 14 kilometers i think he's 17 what he's 17 from the truck to where you were mauled so now you've made it 17 kilometers like that's a huge feat what time of day was this getting later in the day now so i got to my truck about uh quarter to four mauled at 9 36 36 yeah 936 <laughs> I get the picture. Time to prove stamped it. with the photo, the selfie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, is that how you're keeping such accurate memory on time and stuff? Is yeah. selfie? What kind of phone were you I rocking was using at the time? iPhone. Okay. Real fancy iPhone. Yeah. So where are we at Version here? Version one of twenty. <laughs> <laughs> with a three-hour battery life. <laughs> oh no, the battery life was good because it played Baby Shark the whole way, and it played. Right into, I got to my truck, and when I got to Panther River, it uh, it was still playing in my truck at full blast when I got to Panther River. Wow. So, yeah, it's still. That many hours of Baby Shark might have pushed me over the edge. <laughs> you got to go north. Just keep following Highway 40 there. The zigzag. Right, that, There's that, a zigzag. Yeah. And then you go no, stop right the there. Yeah, no, turn on satellite view. Okay, now follow that uh, road. Yeah. Uh, there. Yeah, this looks like where we were before. It kind of comes through the no. foothills. Um, we're zooming a little bit Okay, now oh, there's, uh, there's mountain air. So go south. Yeah. Oops. There's Panther. Oh, there so, there. so I'll follow that road back to the west, southwest. Yep. Yeah. And keep going down. So there's that oh. big switch back. Nope. Down. Right. Down this yeah. way. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. Those leases you're talking about. Yeah. So keep on going down. Keep going. And yeah, there's so right there's my truck is parked where you most just right here. Uh, nope. Farther south. The next intersection. Yeah. Next intersection. Right there. Okay. Right. Yeah. Kind of where the tail end of the most is. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. That's where the gate is, yeah. Right here. Okay. So that's where your truck was, and you were down over here? Uh, yeah, further west. Just want to keep that in the so, picture. We'll just go out. Do. Keep your, uh, no, the drainage above. Yeah, and I'll go straight west down that drainage to the big green spot a little bit further down. No, uh, further west down there. Keep going more and more and more right there. 
So from here to all the way to over here. And there's no sheep in there. And there's no sheep in there. <laughs> None. That is there's grizzly bears. A hell of a long ways. There's, I've heard about that actually. <laughs> Just one that I know of. And your truck is here, and you are now your next destination. The Panther. Panther. Large. So up where it says maps on your uh right. yeah, it's cool. Yep. Where is the keep uh your mouse was uh go straight up from there? Uh no, right to your right a little bit. Zoom in, it'll pop out. Yep. Straight north now. Right there. Oh, there we go. Okay. How are the amenities there? <laughs> They're awesome. Beautiful lodge. They had great uh, ice cold water with uh, with no ice in the yeah. straw. I mean, that was really good. Yeah. So this lodge, what is it? Is it off? This is off the highway. I uh, know it's off of. Uh, it's all gravel in there, and so at the lodge is uh, you can stay in uh, cabins right there at Panther River, right on the Panther River. So they got, uh, I think there's like six cabins and a bunch of canvas tents. You, they do trail rides. You can... Uh, weddings. Weddings, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So... We'll get to that, though. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't jump ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So where you're driving back and you've got to get through all those switchbacks and you're just using the lighter shades of the road as a reference to be able to stay on the road. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was a bumpy ride. And that got you all the way to this lodge we're talking about now. Yeah. So were you ping-ponging off of guardrails and stuff like that? Or was it just really slow? The, the guardrails up there were just uh, steel posts with cable stretched in between them. Um, I thought I was driving kind of more in the ditch. I could feel like the big rocks in the ditch. Yep. Um, I, don't, I don't remember a lot of the driving. I just remember, I, just remember, I guess driving but um it was really bumpy and i remember it took forever it seemed like it take forever probably at least a half hour 45 minutes hmm. uh it was quite the trek like I, I i just remember i thought it was like scraping along the trees and like i thought my truck was totaled when i got to the lodge i honestly thought it was i just the way it felt and i couldn't tell and of course i'd never ran to anybody on the road which is not surprising but i was disappointed yeah <laughs> uh so I get to the turnoff for Panther River, and at this time, it's like a like a two ruts to get into their place. Like it wasn't like a well known spot. Uh, well, it kind of was, but their driveway wasn't that yeah. open. Yeah. So it's I still pulled, back road. Yeah. So I pulled into the driveway and uh, into the parking lot, and there's a bunch of vehicles there. So I tried to park in between a jeep and a, a truck, and I I couldn't fit in there confidently enough. So I was trying to park and. Um, I gave up and I said, screw this. I'm just going to drive up to the front of the lodge where you're not supposed to. So I drove past the do not enter sign and I felt guilty about it. <laughs> the type of feelings you have. They're getting in the way. I, I know. <laughs> so I drove right past the sign, you know, um, got out of my truck and kind of looking around, make sure no one saw me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled right up to, they have like a ramp that you can walk up. So I parked right in front of the ramp and I, uh, walked up their lodge is, uh, shaped like a like an octagon and uh, they have a deck that goes all around the west side of it and uh, it's like a log cabin kind of built and the roof comes down and uh, I remember I was there the weekend before we stayed there and um, if you weren't paying attention you'd smack your head on the logs coming down because it's just how mm. tall it was so I was walking kind of close like in, on the deck didn't really know where the, like, like I knew where the building was but I was just kind of walking around make sure i didn't smack my head on any of these logs sticking out and as i was i got these big bay windows all along the side and i just remember seeing a like a shadow of somebody move something little move away from the window and i was near the door and you know i found the door and i was opening up the door and i remember this uh, like a young kid's voice saying uh uh grandma grandma somebody's trying to play a prank on us hmm. uh i mean of course like you know got I'm doing the zombie walk, you know, and yeah. walking in and with things. your injuries and twigs they, everywhere. Yeah. Are they filming thriller here? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I opened the door and, you know, creaks and uh, you just hear this kid. And I was like, no, I, I just got mauled by a bear. I need some help. And, uh, like, and I, I had my wallet and my phone and like, uh, you know, call my wife and this is who I am. And, 
um, I need some help. And there's like anything we can do for you. I'm like, yeah, I need a glass of medium temperature water, no ice and a straw. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I was very descriptive. They must so. have just jumped. Uh, like, I know the think... service wasn't very good. It took them a while to get it. <laughs> Were they in shock? <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> Uh, well, the one lady is like, um, are you okay? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> they were kind of like standard staring, like they didn't know what to do, right? He's yeah. just sitting there in shock. Yeah. So the one lady uh, grabs me a glass and gets the medium temperature water and puts a straw in it and hands it to me there. And um, the other one ran out the door to go uh, call for help. Yeah. To uh, <laughs> get Amanda. She's one of the uh, one of the owners, and um, it was her. Amanda and her mom and her son was there. Her son was nine years old. He was the first person to see me. And uh, so I'm sitting there in the lodge, you know, sucking back my water, sitting on the, at the, the like, tables in there. And um, I can hear him when talking on the phone and you can just hear people running back and forth. So I hear him sitting at the table and bleeding all over the place. So I grabbed some napkins and I started to clean the floor and the table because, you know, there's <laughs> blood everywhere. And, and uh, I remember the one lady was just yelling at me. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm cleaning up. I made a mess. And she's like, yeah, just like relax. And so <laughs> I got this glass of water. She's like, sit down. And and, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, of course, I'm making a big mess. And they had a, it was around like 4.30, I'm going to say. Uh, they were having a, a wedding was just coming in. They're going to do a wedding out there. So all the parties started showing up. So oh, wow. I was going to show up. Yeah. So they had to get me out of the lodge because, you know, you just, I mean, I just look too pretty at this point. Yeah, to, bad for a turn business. Yeah. You, <laughs> you know, make like, the groom look bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I be the ring bearer? <laughs> Bear. <laughs> <laughs> so they they uh, uh, got me to my truck and uh, drove me around the backside of the lodge and they were trying to figure out like what to do. They were calling for an ambulance or stars and I just remember sitting in my truck and uh, on the passenger side and uh, I had these Gatorade bottles rolling around the floorboard and I couldn't open them or anything. And I asked the one lady, like, can you like open up that Gatorade for me there? And it's like, stick a straw on it. So they did. And I was like, just sucking that back. And oh, it was so good. <laughs> I just remember that I just sucked it right back. And then they opened up the second, there's two bottles there, two one liter bottles. And I was just, just sucking them back. I was, you know, exhausted and dehydrated. Yeah. And then I, the girls were running back and forth. You hear running through the gravel. I'm like, guys, like calm down. Like, it's not a big deal. I'm just missing my face. Just, I don't need <laughs> you getting hurt. <laughs> and so I was yelling at him, tell him to calm down. Like, it's no big deal. I made it this far, you know, like there's not, um, a sense of relief now though, for you, like as yeah. far as now you've, you, you're on the home stretches help, but how was your fatigue? Like before you, you were having a hard time. Like you set your phone, to go off with the alarm to keep you know things going um you know and it's it's easy to try and uh this we need to get back into i think the moment too because you know were you were you fatigued was what was that like for you was it a struggle or um i was when i got to there i was uh, kind of relieved and then after the Gatorade I felt pretty good I was like yeah I'm ready to go again. ready let's to go. go let's go for a walk and now that you had help there it wasn't where you're fighting you know going to sleep but you're just starting to feel optimistic now uh as far as you made it I yeah mean, you I, got you got to where you needed to go yeah I got out and uh my main my I guess goal now switched to keeping everybody calm so I could get out yeah because I didn't want everybody going panic mode and then that would directly affect me so i was trying to keep everybody calm so that they could help me because when yeah. people are not calm and they're freaking out they're making rational decisions which would thus affect me and i probably wouldn't make it yeah. so so now my goal switched to keeping everybody calm keeping the situation calm so they can make clear decisions to get me out of here to get me help uh so then you know i was sitting in my truck in the passenger side and they had this young lady uh, she was 18 years old and she was sitting at the, uh, against the door, fashion door of the truck that was open and we we're sitting there and kind of an awkward situation. She wouldn't look me in the eye or anything. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and we we're sitting there and I was like, so, uh, you know, how old are you? And she would respond I'm like, do you have a boyfriend? You know, like, what do you look like? Uh, what do you do here? <laughs> it's just like the 20 questions, right? The most awkward conversation, you know, I'm looking at her, <laughs> she's staring off in the space and <laughs> just going back and forth. And, um, 
and there there's uh it wasn't the game one, but it was like some park rangers end up showing up and uh i just remember hearing some yelling and like get over there he's over there help him and this guy comes over and uh he comes up from the side of the truck and he gets up to the truck and he's like hey i'm so and so and i turned around and like look at him and he just freaked out and he had this towel he tried putting on my face and of course i screamed because of the you know, it hurt, and the guy was just, I don't know, he would, he just, uh, he he wasn't, like, in shock, and he ended up walking in the back of the truck, and I just remember, like, he's, I can tell he was, like, heaving or throwing up, it kind of sounded like. Wow. And then he left, and then, <laughs> and then, like, yeah, he's just like, yeah, I'm tapping out, that's just too much for me, right? Like, no. <laughs> so, uh, and then one of the other ladies was, like, yelling, I'm like, aren't you going to help him? And he just, I, I don't know, like, there was, something going on. I think it was a little too much for him. So, uh, and the man came running over and she's like, okay, the helicopter is going to be here in about like, in like half hour, right? It's coming. I'm like, okay, sweet. So I'm like, okay, now the helicopter's coming. So, um, we're at Panther river, which, and it's late August. So the bull trout fishing is absolutely amazing there. So I got out of the truck and the one lady was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going fishing. She goes, what do you mean? I said, it's 45 minutes till the helicopter gets here. We're next to a world-class bull, bull trout fishing stream. I'm going fishing. <laughs> and she's like, no, you're not. I'm like, uh, yes, I am. So I had the door open. I'm trying to get my fishing rod. I know my fingers are all messed up. I'm trying to get the case sewed. And Amanda's like, get back in your truck. I'm like, I'm going to go fishing. She goes, no, like, get in your truck. Like, what are you doing? So I'm in my truck there. And then I'm like, okay, can you take off my boots? She's like, no. I'm like, why not? You know, and she's like, no, leave your boots on. Like, just stay put. Don't move. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay, you're nice. <laughs> so then the uh, helicopter lands and uh, uh, I go hobbling over there and get in the helicopter. And they got this, it was a real nice fancy helicopter by the look and, you know, the feel of it. It looked pretty awesome. <laughs> um, I get in there and, of course, they were so polite. They uh, laid out a tarp, nice big blue tarp. And, like, you know, get on the tarp. Don't get your blood anywhere. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so was this stars or no, no this was a, a, a mr chunk whose helicopter was oh it? this was the uh so stars wasn't able to come out and the ambulance didn't know where to go because chris was in the middle of nowhere and it's pretty hard to describe you know go down a gravel road for like 3k take it right down the yeah, two road road and, outside of city limits they're, they're yeah, not doing too good yeah what's the road <laughs> Um, so, uh, Amanda ended up calling her dad and said, we need you down here to fly this guy out. He's in pretty rough shape. So it was, uh, private helicopter, her family, her, family helicopter. Yeah. Her dad's yeah. helicopter. He had a, uh, it's like a six seater turbo jet, pretty sweet helicopter. Yeah. I've ridden it a few times since, but, uh, <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Under much better circumstances. Yeah. Way yeah. Better. They're really doing, they're pulling all the stops though. Like it, in that moment of, you know, frantic, they were, pretty much coming together that fam it was, it was a family run yeah. lodge then family run lodge and then uh some but, of the, a couple of ladies working there yeah everybody knew each other and lived in lived well, shout in out to the area. family yeah what's their lot what's the family's last name uh um uh oh I, I just can't pronounce it <laughs> um straff 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 the yeah, I can't we can look it up, but shout out to the family. <laughs> I mean, they they def, they're pulling through in a big way. Oh, sure. they're awesome. They're uh, if any, anybody out there needs help, they're he's there to help. Yeah, like they jump Saffron. right in. Saffrons, Saffrons, yeah. Saffrons. Yes. Yep. Yeah, um, they're Terry Saffron. He's a he's an awesome guy. He owns a, a small oil company there in, around the Eckville area. And he's very popular, very well known, and uh, he's always out there, willing to give everybody. A, a helping hand anytime they need help. He's thrown, he's flown out lots of people in similar circumstances, like have broken hips or. Oh, really? Yeah. He's the local, local search hero. And yeah. Rescue. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. He's, he's an awesome guy. He's a very down to earth, uh, yeah. very helpful. And, and he was able to get you. So, like, where did they fly? Well, no, this thing. So we get in the helicopter and, uh, it was either fly to Calgary or fly to Sundry. And, you know, flying to Calgary is, like 45 minutes under is like 20 minutes kind of thing or maybe it was closer to an hour to calgary anyways uh so i'm in the helicopter and i don't get the fancy headsets because i didn't really have any ears to put the headsets <laughs> on so i couldn't hear anything and everybody's got their fancy headsets and i hear i'm stuck in this nice little blue tarp and and uh we're taking off and i'm like oh we're in the mountains it'd be great to look out the window for you know see the scenery but you know of course i can't see so i'm trying to uh, i mean it wasn't working but i lean out to look out the window 
And every time I would look out the window, I feel this sharp pain on my left side. And I turn to look and Amanda be sitting there and I turn to look at her and she pulled this blue tarp up. I'm like, well, okay, fine. I don't want to talk to you either. So I look back out the window and I'd be looking out the window and I feel the sharp pain again. And I turn around and I'm like, what? And of course she pulled the blue tarp up again. So I'm like, what are we like playing peekaboo here? Like, leave me alone. I'm just looking out the window. Uh, so she thought I was passing out and she was trying to wake me up. And so, Oh, she was just poking you to try and yeah, get your just, attention. She leans like, into the window. Leaning into the oh. window. She thinks I'm passing out when I'm really just trying to look out the window and see the scenery. But, I mean, you got to have functioning eyes to do that. So uh, I was really trying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so they, they decided they're going to fly to Sundry because I kept passing out. Well, really, I was just looking out the window. And she'd poke me to wake me up. And when I turned to look at her, uh, I was squirting all blood. And so she was trying to cover herself with the tarp and the rest of the helicopter from getting blood everywhere. But yeah. of course I'm thinking she's like, you know, playing peekaboo yeah. with me, like, God, no, I don't want to look at you. And <laughs> the amount of blood you must have lost though over this duration of time. Like, yeah, I don't I don't recall. I mean well, I mean it's pretty hard for you to have a pretty good understanding of it all, but like you're in that moment, how do you keep yeah, <laughs> the awareness no. of it all? I lost 262 mils. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> keep a track. But I mean, drops. that you're staying conscious. Yeah, I was pretty but, calm and uh, fully conscious. Like I knew what was going on. I knew the surroundings. Um, you know, I knew everything was going on. Like I could, I was fully aware. Yeah. Uh, we landed in Sundry and that was kind of interesting. So we landed and uh, uh, I just remember you see a bunch of shapes of people standing outside the door and uh, the door of the helicopter opens up and, you know, there's like, I don't know, probably four or five people standing there and they're like, doot, 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 like, hey, how's it going? And I turned and said, hi. And that's when panic set in. People just, like, everybody went everywhere, just like, holy crap. Uh, one of the doctors tried cutting through the back of the helicopter. They're trying to pull me out. One of the doctors decided to cut through the back, but the helicopter had an open tail rotor. And so Amanda, she was beside me. She jumps out, dives underneath the helicopter, tackles this doctor to the ground, trying to hold him back because he almost walked into the road. Yeah, wow. And uh, and I'm sitting there, and they're trying to pull me out. So she's wrestling this doctor, telling about the blade, yelling out about the blades. Of course, you can't hear nothing. And there's like three people trying to drag me out, and she's yelling at them like, "He got in the damn helicopter. He can get out himself." You know, just panic going on. So I'm trying to get out. My leg is seized up in a straight line i trying to get it over top of the chair in front of me and um you know everybody's just panicking and i'm just like 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 screw off i can get out and she's yelling and then i just feel these arms come from behind me and wrap around me and just and this little nurse and you know, maybe weighing 100 pounds just grab me pick me up and slid me out the helicopter out the, the other, other door side. just like nothing and they uh threw me in a gurney and uh took me into the uh, sundry emergency room and uh, of course, their emergency room is like massive. Like it's like probably the size of this room with a bed and a curtain. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a few people sitting in chairs yeah. there, and, and I'm sitting in there. Like, hey, sorry guys, I guess I get to go first. You know, I'm a little more injured. And... Yeah, it's the emergency room and corner store all yeah. in one. Pretty much, yeah. Put them beside the Doritos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I was in there, and uh, of course, game wardens are in there. And then the first thing they do is they cut all my clothes off me. So I'm laying there butt naked, and they tried to take the tourniquet off my head and stuff and my hands. And I was fighting with them and yelling at them. And Amanda's sitting there yelling at them. And she's like, for God's sake, someone's guys have any decency, cover them up, you know? And um, and then they were bending my knee, and uh, that was causing a lot of pain. So I grabbed one of the doctors and was like, like ready to hit him. And they're like, you know, it was just a Wow. Big mess. And they didn't really know what to do with me. And then they had me laying down and they drilled a hole into my um, collarbone and was giving me a, some antibiotics. And they were just stunned. Like they didn't know. And um, so I was talking with the game wardens, like where did this happened? And I handed my phone and gave them the, you know, the coordinates and everything and uh, told them what happened. And then we're, they're waiting to see if stars was going to pick me up or what was going to happen. So there was no, I guess stars was busy or two windy or they something. They definitely weren't set up for a trauma situation like what mm, what they were no. trying to manage with you. So obviously they they were planning to try and get you to Calgary. Yeah, yeah, because Sundry, I mean, they could put a bandaid on you. And, yeah, that's about it. They're yeah. stabilizing. Slightly better than a walking clinic. Like they're just not set up for. No, they're not set up. Like, it's like an a, older population there, so they do a lot with like heart and um, heart attacks. And yeah. So. Um, 
Can you touch back on the, the whole collarbone and antibiotics? Yeah, I just remember they had this like cordless drill and just bzzz, and, and then they stuck a needle in. Uh, one of the nurses there, her husband had been bit by a bear, uh, you know, quite a few years ago and he had some massive infections. So she just instinctively got some antibiotics that they used on her husband. Makes sense. Just to do something. Like yeah. they didn't know what to do. Um, so drilling into like... That's kind of what I question is the whole drilling in. Are, are they injecting it into the bone marrow for... I just remember them drilling in and I didn't... Like, it, there's so many things happening at once. There's yeah. like four or five people like just ripping apart things and, bzzz, yeah. and I just remember... Yeah. Yeah. It was a weird feeling. At the end of the day, the, the, I think that was a pretty good call on the antibiotic at the very least. I mean, yeah. uh, this, this try and help this guy out. But you're right. I mean, bears, uh, I mean, Phil. anything anything that's a predator it typically doesn't have a very, the, the, the um, bacteria and yeah. chances for infection are pretty high. Very high. Um, yeah. Um, so then the, uh, the got the ambulance and they laid me down in a gurney. And uh, I couldn't have my head flat because uh, when my head back of my head would touch the back of the the pillar of the gurney, it would just be excruciating pain. So uh, um, while the uh, I'm laying down, they had to have a doctor was holding my head uh, kind of off the pillow and kind of holding it together because it, it just keeping pressure on everything, and uh, so I can lay down. So then. Uh, I'm in the ambulance and this one doctor's holding my head and uh, they get the paramedic sitting over top of me and I'm laying down and um, they couldn't figure out where they're going to intubate me from because uh, the breath was coming out of in between my forehead and between my eyes. There's a well, my skull's all busted open there and that was where the kind of air is going out kind of where my nose above where my nose should be. And so laying down, I'd be choking on blood or couldn't breathe. So uh, me and the, um, ambulance driver had a uh, little hand signals. He wasn't allowed, he didn't allow me to talk when I was in there. He wanted me to use hand signals. So I'd stick my thumb between my index and middle finger for like, you know, I'd suck it out of my nose because that's where it was. And if I did uh, like alligator with my hands, it meant out of my mouth mm. to suck up the blood. So he, so we communicated that we had all these fancy hand signals. And um, so they, you know, next ambulance ride to Calgary and, we pull up to the Foothills Hospital, and that's that. Well, that's how they got you. They didn't get the helicopter back to transport you no, by air. No, uh, Amanda and Terry there, they wanted to uh, fly me to Calgary, but they couldn't release me back again. Okay. So, oh, uh, once you're in their care, then because the helicopter wasn't equipped, I get yeah, it. Yeah, okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. So then, because uh, they want That's probably just... not a bad call. You know that? I mean, at this point, you know, the ambulance, so at hour... least you have, yeah. An I guess you can half. make an argument. You got the med medical professionals with you at that yeah. point as well. That's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. But uh, well, did, did a doctor ride with you? Yeah. I had okay. a doctor holding my head together and then the paramedic and then the driver. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it was at full ambulance. Um, so, yeah, we zipped into Calgary and we pulled up to Calgary. They're doing uh, construction in the emergency room. So, the. Uh, Man, <laughs> what is it about this story? Like, <laughs> it's a lodge. No one's there. The, 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 every roadblock possible. I mean, <laughs> it was an adventure. <laughs> yeah, I'm you. So we get to the, get to there, and they had to wheel me through uh, basically where everybody else is um, in the emergency room. So like, so they wheeled me all past all the driver or everybody that's standing in line for the emergency room. And I remember they wheeled me past my family. I didn't know, but they saw me go through with me basically missing my face. They managed to get a hold of your family by this time. Yeah. My family. Oh uh, man. Um, they called them when I was in sundry, they contacted, I think their SMP called my wife and contacted her, let her know. And of course my wife called my, uh, uh, my mom and my sisters and yeah though i mean once your family gets gets word i mean yeah they were sitting there waiting yeah. for me and uh, so they wheeled me through into the uh right into the back right away and uh they asked me if i needed anything i told them i wanted to talk to my wife and see her uh so they were gonna go get her but i told them that they had to cover my face up because you know i was missing it and want my wife to see it hold on one sec not yeah. to interrupt you but I think now would be a really good time for a whiskey. Are you into whiskey? Actually, rum. You like rum? Whiskey. Or water? Surprise me. 
Let's do the uh, the wild turkey. Gobble Joey. gobble. Yeah. <laughs> it's, We'll try it out. <laughs> well, this is uh, this is the uh, the story uh, part of the story where it's almost celebratory. We're, yeah, we're you know we're definitely. on the home stretch. You're getting the home help. Stretch. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. finally. <laughs> so uh, they you know so uh, they put a towel on my face and called my wife and she came in and got to say uh, you know goodbye to her and let her know that you know I tried and uh, I'm gonna miss her and the monster because I was afraid of them putting me out for surgery and me not waking up. Mm. Uh, so now, you know, I'm in there. Yes, I feel safe, but now it comes yeah. to the, I've never been put out for surgery before. So this is a new thing for me. And so I going back down that bad road again, thinking that things are not going to work out. Um, so when uh, they were willing me down, I of course kind of started breaking down and was getting pretty, pretty scared. Uh, one of the doctors there, I remember she was the uh, green-eyed doctor. I just remember her leaning over top of me, right close to my face with the flashlight and stuff, and I can just see she had these bright green eyes and the kindest of voices. And she uh, held my hand, and she says, uh, don't worry, I won't let your hand go. I'll be here beside you the whole time. Mm. And she would, uh, they, they did x-rays, CT scans, and she was right there. The whole hold, time. Holding my hand the whole time. And uh, let me know, and and... It was very comforting because, you know, I didn't want to be alone and I didn't want to fall asleep and I'm laying down. And of course, I'm drifting in and out of consciousness and it was just always nice to have somebody there. Uh, then they wheel me into the surgery room. Uh, you know, I was probably doing a bunch of tests for like at least a half hour or so of tests. And then they wheel me into the emergency room and uh, another doctor joined in, another female doctor, and she had brown eyes. And uh, so they're both standing over me and talking to me. And um, one was holding each hand and they're massaging my hand. And they're telling me the process was going on. And they give you like this charcoal green slime stuff to drink. Mm. Um, so they give me this and try to choke it down. You know, it tastes so good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they're feeding me this and they're telling me that they're going to stick a tube down my throat and then you know to count backwards and um and i was pretty scared i told him that and so they were a uh, doctor massaging his hand and then i remember this aussie voice going don't worry dude i got you down here and he was massaging my feet and then i just remember the putting the tube down and then i thanks and then i kind of well, i guess went under and um i remember the surgery though i remember this little Asian guy stitching my hand together and doing some work on my finger. And then I remember um, this other, this short, bald guy stitching up my knee. And um, quite a while in this uh, other doctor, a little tall guy coming in, he had like a, like a biker's beard and stuff. And he was talking about what they're going to do. And I just remember them stitching my face. And So, okay. Oh, that's what I was wondering. So they're working on you and they're helping you out and you're conscious the whole time here still yeah it's kind of like being like in the movie saw like and i so couldn't they, feel nothing I they gave move. you a sedative yeah i was well they knocked and me out but i wasn't like fully out were you supposed to be out cold yeah i was but you weren't but i wasn't <laughs> like i can see everything that's going on and hear what was going on but i couldn't do anything about it it was just it's a wow. weird feeling like in and out um, like I remember all the people in the room, I was describing and them, and they thought that you were out the whole time. Yeah, and I remember the tube. So when they took the did the second surgery, I told the guy like, "Please make sure I'm out before you stick the tube in." And the guy's like, "No, you're out." I'm like, "No, I wasn't. You stuck that orange tube down my throat, and that sucked. I hated that. Like it just, I don't like that feeling. It was horrible." And the guy's like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "I'm like, make sure I'm out." And so then the third surgery, they did some tests or whatever, and they gave me more more juice to knock me out. <laughs> I was a pretty big dude. Like I weighed, you know, 250 some pounds. So wow. um, I needed a little more than the average person, I guess. <laughs> like it goes back to what I said earlier. Every little thing wrong. in the story. Yeah, like, everything went right. I'm, I'm here. It did. I'm here. It, it did. You're actually it, absolutely. But yeah. Jeremy, Nothing it's, went wrong. it's a hell good. of a, I mean, <laughs> very good. Fascinating. Fascinating story. So the, <laughs> You you got through that surgery and and then well, then what you were able to like 
the moment now where you're reuniting with family. So they woke me up. uh, I did the first surgery was like 13 hours. And then I remember them, I guess they uh, woke me up in the ICU. And the first one they tried to, I tried pulling the tube out and everything and I was fighting. So they had to pull me back under again, remove the tube and then bring me awake. And I remember being in there and I couldn't see anything. Uh, my eyes are like crusted shut, swollen shut, and uh, the doctors are like opening my eyes and shining lights and stuff in there. And <clears throat> and uh, I remember um, talking to the game warden. There was a game warden in there, and he was wanting to do an interview right away, and which is fine. So we did the interview, and um, and I remember like f- falling asleep, and then the bear chewing on me like it just back and forth it was just mm. constant uh you know every 15 20 minutes i drift off and then and the bears chewing on me again and then of course i'd be shaking and breathing heavy and um just in a horrible state and uh, one of my good friends was at the foot of the bed and he just would grab my uh left foot is the only thing that was exposed and that didn't have any injuries on it he'd squeeze it and he'd tell me i'm in a safe place it's okay i'm in a safe place and he used to do that every time that i have a little nightmare or in that situation and um that really helped in that first day i asked for help psychiatric help right away i i just it was going to be a tough battle and that's the first thing i did and it, you know it's hard to tell somebody like hey i need i need help with this like, and, you know i mean I maybe a tough guy but i'm not mentally strong like that's that was hard um so the first day being in icu big struggle you know like all these tubes and everything hooked up to you and uh and then uh, they took me, they were going to take me for the second surgery. And I was pretty pale and kind of cold. And I was complaining about how cold I was. And my wife mentioned something about blood. And they decided to give me, they gave me a unit of blood. And I perked right up again and got my color back. Mm-hmm. And I felt pretty good. And then they, right after that, they wheeled me down for round two of surgery where they put the rest of my face back together. And, um, I guess I didn't have all the pieces because there's a large chunk of my head that was still missing. So, (laughs) (laughs) did did they have did they have your eyelids in round one of surgery? Yeah, yeah. I just keep thinking about how uncomfortable. Oh yeah, so that's no. They put the mask back on. Yeah, they put the mask back on. Yeah, (laughs) it's just in place. Everything worked. Like you could blink. Uh, no, I still can't blink. You have a little bit of control though. I, a, a little bit like i don't blink i kind of just stare out of some yeah. space yeah it's yeah do your eyes water constantly because of that yeah i don't have any drainage uh my tear ducts got pulled out and then they tried doing it twice um the surgery but it wasn't successful so i just whatever it is what it is oh yeah wow that this was obviously one right after the other then the way you were describing your surgeries this yeah. was like a Day very they wanted to make sure tissue wasn't dying off to be able to get it reattached well they had without... to fix, yeah they had to fix my ear and the side of my face my face was uh like kind of drooping and they had to stitch it up and um so what, about, went... what about the fear of blood clots like that that's got to be huge I, I would assume with all that you went through with all the yeah, I dried up components. Then you slap the skin back over top of it. I I would assume that there's high risk for blood clots and breaking free. And yeah, I just strokes. remember it used to give me these needles every couple hours for blood clots. It drove me nuts. I hate needles. Yeah, I'm just sticking them everywhere. Like, ugh. <laughs> wow, Too that's medium. that's quite a. So, did you have to go through a process to be in between each surgeries? Or was it just one after the other? They finished the surgery and then... I get to sleep for a couple hours. And, and then you're right back in there again. Yeah, so the first one was uh, 12, 13 hours. And then I had a, a day of relaxation. And then <laughs> went for another 12-hour <laughs> surgery. Yeah. And then, you know, back to the spa, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sponge baths. No. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they did uh, two, two long surgeries. And then... Uh, and then I got left alone for a little bit to, uh, I guess, catch up on rest and whatnot. And then, uh, I don't know, I think around like day eight is when they started to pull staples out and stitches out, which, you oh. know, there was just a, just a few. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. 
So the one of the things that um, I think a lot of the the people who've gone through experiences like this really want to make sure that there's uh, some some sincere, um, I think, um, appreciation, I guess, is the word I was looking for when it comes to the rescuers and the people that were involved in that whole process of, you know, helping, you know, these people out. And that's been expressed to me a few times. Uh, and, and a lot of the people that I've talked to that, you know, I've been wanting to bring on to share their story, one of the first things that they're mentioning is that uh, it wasn't their story. It was just as much about the people that were involved and, and it was about them. And so is that something that, you know, is, is with you too, is the, the appreciation for, you know, some of these nurses and the doctors that were involved and, you know, the support and maybe, you know, some of the experiences that your family, your wife had gone through and whatnot were, you know, you want to make sure there's, you know, acknowledgement and appreciation for these people that had you know kind of helped you through some of this i had some spectacular nurses that worked at the foothills hospital in the burn unit unit 33 when i was there um i had some incredible nurses i had one nurse uh, she was a charge nurse uh, lots and she worked night shift she'd come in at uh, 5 a.m every morning and would clean out my eyes because my eyes would be all um kind of glued shut from all the pus and everything and she would clean out my eyes every morning to come in there and it, we called it our 5 a.m. date. So she'd come in and clean my eyes. And uh, when I had visitors come over, she would uh, shave and trim my my beard up. <laughs> and she would shave and trim me and make me look pretty, you know, help me look pretty. And I mean, I look pretty darn good in those hospital mini skirts, I got to say. <laughs> I, looked, I looked really good. <laughs> and so, you know, one there's actually two of the nurses there that would uh, clean my eyes. One was in there, the other one would. They would uh, help me dress, and my wife got me this real nice uh, plaid shirt to wear, and they would help me put it on when I had visitors, you know, because sometimes just to help look a little bit more decent, and, you know, they'd cut my hair I had left, and <laughs> <laughs> they they're very good, very, you know, uh, they treated me very well. Um, they actually would fight over who got to pick my nose or uh, oh, wow. uh, yeah. to, like, squeeze the pus out of my face because, you know, it... it they'd squeeze it and move it all around. And, 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 uh, I mean, the best part was when they, uh, they still shoved gauze up my nose and, and I couldn't breathe. And they had that in for like at least three, four days. And I kept complaining about it. No one knew what to do with it. Um, so finally they got a word from the doctor said, yeah, go ahead and pull it out. Well, one of the nurses comes and pulls it out and looked like a, like a clown. It just kept coming and coming out. And then it was this, this huge piece when they pulled it out. It just felt so good to have it out of there. And then, you know, they pulled the other side out and like, it was, you know, probably six inches long. It felt like, wow. Because oh, <laughs> it was in my nose and you feel in the top of your roof of your mouth and yeah. like a cotton mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then yeah, that's, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> How did you survive that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but then your nose would dry out and it, you know, of course everything would bleed and you get all this pus. So then you get like, these massive boogers and of course you can't do nothing because you you know my fingers are all in bandages and i couldn't bandages feel. swelling you know yeah. pain pain management the healing process is is severe yeah and like i mean it, you know it's it's uh it's kind of funny you'd have to like ask nurse hey can you like pick my nose and they'd be like oh really and they all get excited right they come out there and they get like little they get like this little gel stuff and they get these little q-tips and they get it all nice and wet get the tweezers out and they're like oh this is a really big booger today and like it was there was some like this other nurses really enjoyed it because they got like get to play and, and i didn't complain much well i hope I, I hope i didn't um but they would come in and uh they'd it would, we'd have fun we'd joke around we'd laugh we'd have you know, just have fun with it. Like, what else am I going to do? I'm, I'm laying there. I mean, they're pulling out stitches and staples and, and they're like, you know, does that hurt? I'm like, oh yeah, that was horrible. Or you just, you know, joke around. And I mean, they felt bad doing it, but man, I love yeah. your attitude. You know that it's just, it's <laughs> freaking awesome. It's such a very positive, I think, outlook on it. It's, it's, uh, it's one of those things where it's almost, uh, I don't know. It's reassuring and, and refreshing in a lot of ways. I don't know why, but the, so many people would have been, Oh, woe is me. Yeah. And exactly. This is the most horrific thing. And it is, it is, it is. Not, not to make light of it because it is <laughs> no, the most it, horrific it, thing that someone could go through, but your outlook. And I mean, to hear you tell the story, to read the book and read your words 
And every part of the way when you're interacting with people uh, or your outlook on, let me clean this up. Oh, I'm so sorry for, for how I left this. Like it is such a breath of fresh air that your positivity shines uh, and, and your positive personality and outlook are just phenomenal. Just because I got a mobile bear doesn't mean I have to be rude and mean to everybody else. <laughs> no, <it> didn't. <laughs> No, no, but I, that's the takeaway. Uh, and and we were talking about this a little bit earlier too, uh, which I wanted to touch on because this story I think is going to have uh, an impact on who knows a lot of people. We had mentioned earlier that some of these um, experiences and and um, you know scenarios have have been seeming to be common a little more common lately, especially this year. You know, Aaron is in Dawson Creek and. I know of three people right now, just this year alone, who have had, you know, very serious um, encounters with wildlife. And this does have a little, a longer um, mental effect. Uh, sometimes that could be a little bit more, a little more impactful than even the, the physical injuries. And I think that's what a lot of people grapple with. And to hear a story and your perspective and how you're managing it, I think is something that's got a lot of value for people who have gone through scenarios like that. And, and we were talking about PS, uh, PTSD, yeah. uh, which is something I'd like to touch on because uh, these are things that I know you had experienced and, and how do you navigate through that and, and manage it? That is probably one of the more um, underrated experiences that a lot of people are still becoming more aware of. And I think, you know, whether there there's a little bit of an understanding on how to deal with it or not. I don't think the general public and the perception of it is where maybe it should be. Uh, so it's a, it's a hard thing to admit and ask for that psychiatric help. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very hard thing to do. And it was hard for me, but it's one of those things I, I knew I needed to do because I needed help with it I, and something was wrong and I needed, I need somebody to help me guide me through that. Like, I, I don't know how to accomplish that on my own. And it's, you can't, it's, it's hard. What what did you do for help? Like you you kind of touched on it. You mentioned it at the beginning. You know when you were going through surgeries, you ha you started having, uh, you know, moments of where nightmares and flashbacks. Exactly. Um, that was an early onset of it. Uh, how did you manage to get through all of that? Uh, it, was, it was very 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 tough. Um, it, it was constant. We had to have somebody in the hospital twenty four seven with me because if I I went into a flashback or, or having a nightmare. Um, what what do you do? And I was a pretty big guy. And, uh, you know, your first thing would be try to restrain the person is what, you know, everybody saw it as when somebody was flaring, trying to hold them down. And that just made it worse mm -hmm. because it, like the bear did, the bear held me down. And, and so I'd get more and more violent. And um, I was just trying to train people or, or have my family there to, you know, squeeze my feet, tell me in a safe place and that would get me out of the nightmare um almost instantly uh so that, it, was, it was a struggle all throughout the hospital when i got out uh it it was all the time and i mean there was uh some points time we'd find that we'd find the triggers and how we did that would uh, i'd keep a diary and i'd keep track of uh what i ate the stresses in the day where things happened my sleep patterns and things that happened before or after the flashback, like the closest thing I could remember what happened uh, to try to help me figure out what the triggers were so things to stay away from. Um, one of the things that we found was a trigger was when you, know, you take an ice tray and you take out the freezer and you twist it to crack it. Well, that sound of that ice popping out sounds like when, a, you know, when your skull is getting crushed by a bear. That's kind of what it sounds like. And that, uh, you know, at work, one guy was... Uh, getting a glass of water and putting ice in it. When you did that, it put me into a flashback. It was a trigger. It was a trigger. And that was just instantaneous. Put me right into that moment where um, the bear is dragging me back off for round And three. that's one of the things that I think a lot of people aren't quite as aware of, including myself up until just today when we were talking, is that a lot of these um, triggers and scenarios happen in day-to-day -day activities. So it could be work, you could be broad daylight and something, a sound, a smell, a sight, something can trigger it and you go into, well, what, what happens? Like when that, like, do you it, go into a trance or? So it's just like you're reliving the, 
the event over again. So when, uh, for instance, when someone does like the ice tray and you hear the ice breaking, it brings me back right to the moment where the bear grabbed me by the back of the head and pulled me back into the bush. It brings me right back into that as if the bear is chewing on me. Um, so certain things just, it, it bring me back into relive that. And when you say it pulls you back, is that a dis? Are you? Is there a disconnection with reality? And now you're in that moment. Yeah, and- it's just a total like disconnect. Like you're, um, I don't know, getting beamed somewhere. Like it's just instant. You're, uh, you know, you be walking down the street, and all of a sudden you're a bear's chewing on you, and you're in the forest, and a bear's chewing on you. Like it's and at just- that time, you don't even know what the trigger was, and that you're experiencing that until you've gotten through it. And now you realize what had happened after, you know, yeah. a period of time. Yeah. That's in itself an experience that's got to be a little bit on, you know. Well, uh, it, it's very confusing because you, when you go into it and you're getting attacked by the bear and then you get brought out of it, you're like, well, where am I? Happen? And you're, um, it's kind of like having two dreams in one. So you go into the moment, the bear's chewing on it. And then all of a sudden you bring back to reality and you're thinking, the bear is just here. It's coming back. And so even though you're, you know, you're in your room, you, you know, and you're out of the dream, like you don't see any trees or anything around, but you're still thinking the bear's coming back. So it's like a double whammy. It's just. Is it like, you know how when you have a dream and then you wake up and like the wife is really pissed off at you because you cheated or something stupid. And you're like, man, that never happened. It's not reality. But she's like, I'm still mad at you. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, it's, that, yeah. like <laughs> it's not even a thing, but it still kind of is because, you know, but then, you know, an hour or two later, you can hardly remember the dream. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I don't know if the, anybody, everybody can relate to that, but it, it's like, can you in there? <laughs> but I think, you know how it is. I think everybody has yeah. a story. Yeah. It's like when you, uh, you dream about falling and then you, you wake up because you got to go pee because you're just falling. And then all of a sudden you fall when you get out of bed, you fall. Yeah, exactly. And, okay. Yeah, it's like, just bang, bang. Like, well, that's like, it just, yeah. But it's really confusing because you don't like, where am I? How do I get here? When you, you were there and then you go and like into the stream state and you come back to reality and it's just, it's hard to grasp. Like it's just, uh, it's, it's very confusing and it's, you know, you lose your, things are spinning and, and it's just. It's a lot more real than I think people realize. The yeah. term PTSD and all of that, I think, doesn't have the understanding for people to take it seriously. No. Uh, especially the way you just described it. So you're physically in that moment. Yeah, it's you, a physical yeah, state. In your brain, you're in that, you're reliving that. You relive in that. And it's very vivid. And the feeling, the, I mean, you don't feel pain, but the frightness, the scaredness, it's right there. It's in the moment. And to go from, you know, every day, like, you know, walking down the street, whistling to, a bear's chewing on you. You're fighting for your life to back to reality again. And it's just, you're confused. Like, does this just happen? Mm-hmm. Where's, where's the bear at? I was just getting chewed on by it, but why am I surrounded by, you know, four walls? Like, it's just, it's. So what did you do uh, in that process? Where did you go and who helped you? And what's the way to be able to manage going through those experiences? Uh, so I saw, uh, well, in the hospital, I was seeing a couple of therapists for it. Um, and it was just trying to find the triggers or what things started it so that we so that we can narrow it down things to avoid. Um, if it was a stressful day at work, then I uh, take uh, well. If it's a really stressful day at work, that would be possibly a trigger. So I had some sleeping meds to help me sleep so I could be able mm-hmm. to get some sleep. And uh, or um, if I had a stressful day at work have like a, a mindful time, you know, to relax and reflect on things to help, um, to help with it. So it don't, doesn't cause a problem at night. So stress and fatigue was kind of making you more prone to, for, for something like this to happen. Correct. So that was the main thing. So if I was very stressed out, very fatigued, the chances of me having a nightmare was, you know, hundred percent, mm. um, diet, I didn't diet. I kept track of it just to make sure, you know, just eating healthy and just to see if there was anything with the diet. Like if I, you know, had too much caffeine or sugar, I mean, of course, caffeine and that does not work well when you're <laughs> <laughs> trying to sleep, <laughs> uh, no, trying to sleep or, uh, or trying to 
Um, like I went through some stages where you're not sleeping at all. And of course you're always tired. So you drink energy drinks and I mean, that would make the nightmares even worse. All that caffeine and it just, yeah. it, it never, it, it doesn't work out. Um, you're so slapping you, a bandaid on the wound. You're not actually fixing the problem. Yeah. And then it, yeah, it, it makes the problem worse. It makes it worse. You didn't actually fix anything. You just, no, you get accelerated at it. Yeah. Now you get accelerated heart and you're going yeah. a little crazy and lots of caffeine and no sleep. I mean, it, <laughs> <laughs> There's a point in time you just ah yeah. <laughs> well, what about you know you, you mentioned uh, the the example or analogy of uh, ice trays. Um, how do you like when you're making a list of things to try and avoid? There's got to be a point in time where you, you you need to manage it, and eventually, like you from our conversation earlier, it sounded like you're able to find ways to be able to actually process some of that, so it wasn't quite as much of a a trigger or a situation that yeah it's is easier to manage it's like when you're a kid and you hear or and you know as an adult you hear the ice tray break you're like oh well there's gonna be some it's a hot day and there's like cold drinks you know you gotta put some ice in there right like you're so that sound uh when my brain got associated with something chewing on my head instead of a nice cold iced tea yeah instead of thinking of it's nice yeah cold iced tea <laughs> or lemonade right so um it's once you once you're able to once I was able to determine what the triggers were is just how do you reprogram your brain to think that it's, it's, you know, like a, you know, iced tea, you put ice cubes in. Right. So that, that's a hard part. Um, and trying to find triggers, it was very tough. Like, how do you, I mean, it took months and months to find, to figure out what they were. Like one of the ones that stumped, uh, stumped us for quite a while was, uh, I was having tons of nightmares and everything at work was going good. Uh, I wasn't working any overtime. I wasn't fatigued. I was getting, you know, lots of sleep, lots of rest. Well, I guess I wasn't getting much sleep, but um, <laughs> I was lots of rest and I was getting tons of flashbacks, nightmares. They were coming, uh, you know, every night, four or five times a night. It was horrible and, and everything was going good. You know, it was a really good stretch for probably four or five months of very few to now like, every day every night for you know and one of the dumbest things that you would think of that wouldn't think would be a trigger uh ended up being i was getting in shape again because i wanted i wanted to get back in shape because i was pretty out of shape from all this and um i was trying to get back into shape and that was a trigger and it was just kind of weird until one of my buddies said well it makes perfect sense um, what did you do before you got mauled by the bear? Well, I mean, I had a personal trainer. I got in really good shape to go sheep hunting. He goes, and what are you doing now? Well, I'm trying to get back into shape again, but I'm not going hunting. You're right. That's a very tough one to figure out. Yeah, that would have been a crazy one. Yeah. And he's, he's like, well, duh, it's a trigger because you, what you're doing now is what you did before the bear attack. So it, it just, it's crazy how your mind works yeah. and how, and how it just puts things together for you without even realizing um, and that was a huge one. And at, at that time, um, this was probably down the three and a half year mark of having, you know, constant nightmares and sleeping, you know, 12 hours a week. Like it was a very rough time. Wow. Uh, then I managed to get into a program for uh, ART, um, which is for uh, trauma. And it's just basically reprogramming uh, the brain. So if you hear a certain sound or a noise, and how you relate that to it, like, you know, the ice tray, you, breaking ice, you know, you get nice iced tea coming up, right? Um, versus something chewing on your skull. So these, so just the ART is like going through that process of reprogramming your brain. Uh, ART and I had this on my phone. Crap, what is that word? Something therapy, antra. I'm going to just share this so the viewer and everybody it's, else. It's like a, um, where are we at? Here we go. Boom. So I can't pronounce it either. I, I have <laughs> this, this is right here. Antra, Antra, or Otto. What the? No, that's not it. That's not all. Oh, thank one. God. No, that's a different one. <laughs> ART. Trauma therapy. It's like a s accelerated. Um, I can't pronounce it. I this PTSD art therapy trauma and PTSD. That's yeah. Um, auxiliary resolution. 
Oh, this yeah, one? acceleration resolution therapy. Yeah, for trauma. So where did he? Is this so? Where did he go for this treatment? I w- I did this treatment at the Foothills Hospital in Calgary. Okay. Um, I did a I did three total sessions with them, and each session is about forty five minutes to an hour. And the uh, very first session I did lasted uh, forty five minutes, and uh, that night I slept the most I've ever had since the bear attack. I was able to sleep seven, eight hours solid, no nightmare, nightmare free. Um, it's effective. It, it, for me, it was, I mean, it may not be effective for everybody, yeah. but for me, it was, it was astounding. Like it just, it made so much difference in my life you, right away. You had nightmares every night for three years until your third, first session, session or third session? So the first session. And the then very you slept first. through the night. Slept through the night. Wow. After three years. A thousand days of nightmares. Yeah, it just uh, some days would be rough. Like we'd be watching TV, and they'd have like a documentary show, and all some bears would pop on, and my wife would be like, "Yeah, I'm staying up. I'm not sleeping tonight because she'd stay up all night, and make sure if I was going into nightmares, she'd be there at the foot of the bed massaging my feet." Um, you know, there's a few times in the middle of the night she will wake up to a thump, and it'd be me having a nightmare, falling out of bed, and a couple times I'd knock myself out, hitting the nightstand, or I'd wake up. We'd wake up, or she'd wake up in the middle of the night, and the bed would be covered in blood, and I'd, you know, I'd smack my head or face and bleed all over the place, and, mm. um, you know, crawling down the stairs. Uh, my neighbor found me underneath my, uh, in the backyard in February, in my underwear crawling across underneath my deck in the snow, and um, I was out hunting the the year that I got mauled out, um, in on the prairies in Alberta, and. Uh, and the uh, owner of the hotel found me in the middle of the night trying to crawl across the road. I was in the middle of a flashback. And, um, it's so unpredictable. It is. And it just like the strangest things would start it. You, do you have um, a website or information you can send to me uh, or that I can put in maybe the show notes that if people are interested, they can just look on this podcast and look in show notes and just hit a link that, you know, maybe was helpful for you that would give them kind of a point of direction to kind of start figuring some of this out. Yeah. I got some for, uh, yeah, I, I definitely send you some links. Yeah, well, that'd, that'd be good. And that was one of the cool things after our podcast, when we aired your, our session of hunt hard talk free, um, I had a guy the very next day reach out to me saying, Hey, my buddy was mauled by a bear. And I think, you know, the, the story yeah. of one of the local ones that we're not ready to talk about yet, but, no. um, the friend reached out and said, Hey, um, what was that, that you guys talked about for that therapy? So I shot you a message while he was messaging <laughs> me on Facebook. And I said, Hey, what was that therapy? And you sent me a quick email link. I sent that to him. He then reached out to the family of the victim and he was so thankful that, Hey, if this helps that did family, you, did, that's amazing. And it all, we, we did it live while buddy was messaging me. Oh, on that's Facebook. cool. He had just watched <clears throat> the podcast. And was asking me, what is that therapy you're talking about there? And so it was, so I quickly texted him and could answer the questions instantly. And I sent off an email with all the information for the art therapy. Uh, have you been in contact with him, Jeremy? Like, have you made the, no. it did, no, 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 no. No. So this was, this wasn't the victim or the victim's family. This was a good friend of the victim that just reached out and said, Hey, my buddy was just mauled. Um, what was there was that? another one in uh, Dawson Creek this summer with a uh, black bears, two women. Yeah, uh, probably yeah. could. You know, I was right after the podcast that we did, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very uh, recent. Before, very recent. Yeah, yeah, there was a big fund. I told you about the fundraiser. Yeah, kind of a a lighter story about that is we went to uh, Corlane's, bought a table for that fundraiser, and donated some prizes and stuff like that. So um, I had a couple spare tickets, so I invited some friends, and uh, the guy's brother came in from out of town. He he flew in from Toronto, and uh, and he's like do you have a third ticket? Cause I'd love to come to this too. I said, yeah, come on, j- join us. So his wife texts him, Hey, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> and his response is matter of fact, I'm going to a fundraiser to support women attacked by bears. And she's like, come on, <laughs> no, but seriously, what are you doing tonight? And he's like, no, seriously, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> she's like, 
it happens often enough that they have <laughs> annual fundraisers for women mauled by bears. No, 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 no. It was just too. Yeah, women exactly. Mauled. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was the okay. wording okay. of it. Yeah. <laughs> I can see where the confusion might have been been raised. <laughs> what kind of a town did you just go to visit? That, that's yeah. pretty amazing. To, that's pretty amazing to do that. I mean, that hearing that is is uh pretty awesome. Like it's surprising. Have Jordan. you found? Okay, so. One of the things that I learned with the podcast is that a lot of people, just in this day and age, communication isn't a thing, right? Um, and to have the opportunity to be able to talk about, you know, something, whether it's a personal story or maybe an experience or whatever it might be from one person to the other on the podcast, has the ability to be able to tell that story in a way that they never normally get a chance to, uninterrupted. You know, and it's almost therapeutic in some ways. And a lot of people feel, you know, like if a sense of accomplishment and it was a really good time. Weirdly enough to talk about a conversation, you know, and associating, you know, fun and, and almost like a therapeutic element to it is odd, you know, but it's true. Uh, we're a social species. Humans need to associate with each other. That's why cabin fever is a thing is because if we don't have contact and the ability to communicate with other people, it's not a healthy byproduct. And yet that's one of the things that we try and do the most is internalize and feel like it's for us to own. And like what you had touched on, uh, reaching out for help is a sign of weakness, which in reality is the exact opposite of that. It's it's strength. It's a strong mind. It's uh, a lot of attributes that I think people need to embrace a little bit more. Um, and I say all of that because I'm wondering if now in a situation like what you've gone through, does that still apply? You know, when you've gone through an experience where, you know, it's not something, it's very sensitive, near and dear, that is very hard to unpack because it it brings you back and is almost, you know, maybe even a trigger, you know, where it puts you back into those, um, that event. You've written a book, uh, you know, and you've done now multiple different podcasts. Is this something, is that something that has helped you? Like, would you recommend people try and fight that urge to just bury it? Uh, maybe, and whether it's through private, like help in one form or another, I'm not saying come on a podcast, <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, reach out and be able to actually verbalize it somehow, you know, to somebody. I mean, some people that works very well with, uh, with me, uh, in the start, when we started doing the interviews, when the book was coming out, uh, so when it, when we kind of set the date, it was September 27th when the book came out. I found out early August and of course the anxiety was hitting and I had, you know, a couple of minor nightmares around that time. And, um, at first it was hard to talk about. There's a lot of things that I just didn't want anybody to know and didn't want to, I like, you know, wanting to end my life there on the mountainside was something pretty hard for me to actually put down on paper and share that. Uh, that was very tough and very hard for me to talk about it. And I mean, on the Hunt Hard Talk Free podcast it was the first time I've actually admitted it and said it myself instead of in the book. Um, that was very tough. And I now talking about it, it's a little bit easier, but still it's, it's tough. It was um, a tough, it was a tough question to ask. Yeah. What I wanted to talk to bring it to light because it was in the book so i knew it was something that you had put down on paper that everyone would read and i wanted to you're I, talking I about questions. asking him to come on to the the podcast Just, well no or, in or, the or, podcast i asked him about um so i asked him about coming onto the podcast we yeah. set it up that was great he sent me a digital copy of the book before it was released so i could read through it i read it cover to cover in a couple sittings because it's so riveting and so gripping so quick plug if you haven't got the book get a copy of it. i it's was gonna amazing. plug the hell out of it i'll just throw it up here while you're talking <laughs> so <laughs> while i read the digital copy that was one thing that really hit me hard as I, I mentioned earlier and i had to stop and i'd go back and reread it is that what what happened and it is it is one very short paragraph within it and so it was just on my list of talking points that i wanted to 
to talk about and, and commend him for being able to put that in writing because that would be so difficult. So mm-hmm. um, I brought it up, I, I, I'd say in a fairly respectful manner. And I just, I asked you about it and, and, and made note of it and you responded to it. Um, I won't say quickly, you responded to it and moved on. And so of course at that, I, I picked up the social cues and continue on with the story and get into the next part of it. So, I mean, for me, it's it's absolutely amazing to hear you dig in a little bit more now. And and it's you've openly talked about it on this podcast here and now, which I didn't, I didn't dare ask another question about it because <laughs> I picked up on the cues and, and noticed the uncom- un- uncomfortable vibe in the response. So move on because there's still an epic story to continue on with, right? That's not what the story is about. But I think it speaks to the to the the despair and the the lack of hope that you were at in that stage. Not only and not the pain, but the the lack of hope. And and that's what it comes down to is you didn't expect to make it out of there. No. And so with the pain level that you were at with everything with falling down into that river valley with everything that had happened up until that point, like what the hell am I doing? Why am I pushing this on longer? What why am I enduring this horrific 20 out of 10 pain level here with no hope or so the unbearable we were talking about you know mental stamina and strength and uh the human body is just a machine and is designed to want to survive that standard i think just with humans the biggest factor though is the mind yeah and that is i think the deciding factor between people who you know get past comfort zones and have goals and achieve you know really successful uh you know things for themselves in their life and other people's who who might not because there's a lot to be said about you know the mind and what you had you know just done setting goals you know from the time that you encountered that bear you know all the way up until you got help you know little nuances like how other people were reacting after you had just gotten yourself uh, out of the bush and driven all the way to the lodge and the initial shock that people had of, you know, scatter, a disorganization in one form or another. And you're able to bring that sense of um, calm to people to allow them to be able to react a little bit more uh, efficiently and with sound mind. To have gone through that experience speaks tremendously about, you know, I'm going to just say you're a you're a tough son of a bitch, you know, you, uh, physically, <laughs> physically too, but, mentally. but men more so mentally. I yeah. mean, that is, uh, it's attributes that I would hope that I would be able to portray and hold myself to if I was ever in that situation. The thing is I've never been in that situation. So ideally in my mind, you know, it's like if I was years ago to encounter a bear, it's like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to dodge the guy in, or the bear with a tree. You know, how you think you're going to react and the reality of a lot of things, <laughs> wildly different. So, you know, hats off to you and your ability to now even follow through with all of that in the form of being able to write a book uh, and talk about it in as much detail. I'm shocked at how much detail and um, you're able to articulate a lot of, you brought us into the experience that you had. Uh, that is not easy to do. Uh, most people that are in situations like that, it's one of the, the, the things that cops end up training. You don't take witness statements from people that were in traumatic situations because the ability of sure. their memory and yeah. their perception, a lot of times are wildly different. Um, And there might be a lot of differences with what your story is, but they overlap, I think, with exactly what had happened with the fact that you went out there and the timelines and everything else correlate to your story. So just that reinforces the fact that, you know, your ability to be presence of mind and rational is, is uncanny in my opinion. And I I'm thankful that you were willing to come on and share your story because I really do think that, I mean, proof is that, you know, a hunt hard talk free episode with Aaron touched a lot of people. 
And definitely that it would be a shame if those same people never had that ability to hear your story because of whatever reason, you know, so you're really making a positive change out of all this. It's huge. It's massive. I at least had, uh, from that podcast within the first week, at least half a dozen people reached out to me and asked me, they wanted to come talk to me and share their story. Um, at that time I was doing book signings in a little, uh, town called Eckville at, uh, a place called uh, Stacy's Happy Place. It's a little used bookstore in a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and this one guy drove over eight hours just to come tell me his story. And I mean, that was, that was amazing. And he said, I heard it on Hunt Hard Talk Free. And, uh, you know, it took me a week or so to figure out if I'm going to come down to you. And I, he didn't want to talk to me. He was sitting there in the this little tiny bookstore and he just didn't want to come talk to me. So I approached him and then he was telling me about his story and just wanted, how did, how would I get over that situation? You know, and it's really hard. Um, everybody's different, but I just, you know, uh, it's kind of the things that what I did, what worked for me, like the backpack and the clothes that I got attacked in, um, that's a trophy. I hang that on my wall and I'm proud of it. Um, you know, it doesn't, it does bring back some emotions, but, happy emotions like i survived that you know i made it through that to me that that's a trophy it's something i should be hung on my wall and, uh, and i'm proud of it yeah yeah i agree 100 percent um we should we should do some plugs here and then maybe wrap things up we're we're probably like well over three hours here <laughs> are we yeah yeah it's we started eight i'm looking at my thing here it's just Three and a half. Three and a bit. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not saying let's shut her down. It's just uh, I'd like to, to kind of make sure we touch on some stuff that I think is worth touching on before uh, your book. So I'm going to share this again. It's on Amazon. Yeah. It's called, and uh, uh, it's also on corelanes.com. Yeah. Corelanes.com. <laughs> you, you definitely got to pick it up there. Yeah. Or uh, Well, I was going to touch on the Hunt Hard Talk Free, but uh, yeah. Amazon here is 25 bucks for paperback. And... Uh, yeah, that's pretty. Is it only on Amazon? No, it's, it's on, on uh, besides it's on, okay. it's on uh, <laughs> corylines.com, uh, grizzlydude.ca. There we go. You know uh, what? Actually, we should bring that up. Let's, let's, corylines.com here before we move on. Let's, let's share. Um, I hope the boys have updated that we got them back in. We just got them back in stock today. Yeah, so, hopefully, today. I don't know if they've hit the website. Oh, today. you're going to call, we'll you're going to call me on that. Oh, wait actually, a minute. They, yeah, they hit the Facebook. <laughs> you're on Facebook. <laughs> we did push it on Facebook. Yeah. Um, so you can uh, get the book on uh, corelines.com <laughs> grizzlydew.ca grizzlydew.ca uh, do you have shipping? yes I do perfect um, you also can get the, the book at uh, Rocky Mountain Books um, Chapters Indigo uh, your local bookstore I mean, it's also at Stacy's Happy Place a uh, little used bookstore at Eckville um, uh, Trapper's Gordon Trapper Gordon's uh, Grand Prairie Yep, uh, My Poacher's trouble. Corner. Holy crap! Uh, the fishing hole even carries it. Uh, Calgary and the Edmonton location. Backcountry is about to be carrying it in Fort yep. St. John. Yeah, actually, Backcountry on does carry it. I don't see it on um, your website, Aaron. Search for it. It's called Mauled Life Lessons Learned from a Grizzly Bear Attack. <laughs> I do want to ask you though, while while he's gonna hold me to this. <laughs> oh, I gotta find out now. Uh, we plugged the hell out. No, because it was out of stock until today. So oh. it has no. Oh! Oh, you it's got it. It's, on there. There. it's the most viewed. There you go. That's because I was on there for like last hour looking at Oh, it's it. more expensive than Amazon. Oh, by how much? They were 25, <laughs> 25 cents. Oh, okay. <laughs> but they had but $10 shipping. I will say more money if you buy it on this website goes into his pocket than if you buy it off yeah. Amazon. I hey, absolutely. And you're, is you're shopping. Is this in the uh, in the moving forward? Moving forward. The Dawson <laughs> Aaron, the Dawson Creek store and the Prince George. I don't know if PG has got their shipment yet. They ordered it after we sold out on the first shipment. We sold out our first. I mean, normally we'll order a dozen books to test out how books sell in the store. And we've got three book racks and stuff. So we ordered a case of 30 books. They sold out within about 23 days to sell out the whole case. So we've got, we got a second case coming. And now talking to Jeremy, we're going to be buying more just directly off of him moving forward. We're just trying to figure out the logistics of shipping to get from him to us. But we want to do what we can to support Jeremy and and get his story out there to as many people as possible. I mean, when you look at it on Amazon, it is in their top selling books and has been now yeah. for, since August 
Yeah, since on since pre-sales, uh, actually in pre-sales, it hit uh, in the top 156 books, uh, bestsellers on Amazon. And I, when I looked it up, there's 33 million titles sold on Amazon. That's amazing. Yeah, so now I think it's sitting around the top 4,000 on Amazon. And it's kind of hanging around the two to 4,000 mark, um, well, since it came out. So the book was released on September 27th. And by the uh, third week of October, second week of October, it was completely sold out. Uh, the first print was 2,500 copies. Wow. And it sold out, in, like I said, in three weeks. And then they did another print. Uh, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think that is also sold out because, uh, you know, I want, I'm doing a, this book signing tour here of uh, Grand Prairie and Fort, or, or sorry, uh, Dawson, Dawson and uh, Fort St. John. I was hoping to get more books, um, but yeah, I can't because they're so heavy. <laughs> Everybody's, yeah, it seems to be right across the board. Are they, did they tell you when you're going to be able to get more stock? I think early January. I think they're going to do another okay. print. Okay. Uh, I hope so because we got uh, I got some sportsman shows to do. I've been invited out to do some presentations and um, you know make another couple uh, book tour trips, maybe another podcast trip. We can talk to you about the Wild Sheep Society Foundation fundraiser that's happening in Dawson Creek in uh, February. Okay. And I'll hook you up with Corey Green, who oversees a lot of that here as well. And we, we whatever connections we have, we'll throw them your way because if, awesome. if, if, if it helps. What about Graph? Brand and throw it out there. What about gra- like shirts? Hats. You have Hurts. a tremendous oh, amount of merch. <laughs> yeah, so we can't forget about that. <laughs> so there's lots of uh, Grizzly merch. It, it, it was... Uh, I was nicknamed the grizzly dude from uh, the nine-year-old boy, the first one that saw me. So uh, after the mauling, uh, no one really knew my name, and they wanted to keep it quiet, so they called me the grizzly dude. And so that name stuck uh, all throughout the hospital and uh, even now. And it was just it was kind of funny. It was more like uh, at work we were messing around with uh, logos just for just for giggles is to see and, yeah. and we we're like oh the grizzly dude and we came up with this logo and uh some people at work saw it, like oh when are you gonna make shirts i'm like what do you mean like well, we want to order some shirts and it just it ended up being oh i gotta do this so we got a bunch of shirts and uh grizzly dude um and then uh, you can bear it i think that's the slogan you, can bear, it. you can bear it <laughs> i like that I thought, one that i was... thought it was fitting <laughs> um yeah and in uh you know uh i like to my goal is i like to help people with uh, who suffered traumatic events uh, like this in the in the wilderness, and I like to um, raise money and put it towards uh, helping people with PTSD in these traumatic situations. Uh, so, with the merge, I'm trying to I like to go down that path where if I can start raising some money uh, to help uh, put money towards PTSD and ART therapy, just so that more people like me can actually get some help and have somebody yeah. to talk to. Uh, that's, that's what I really want to do. And uh, you know what? I'm just starting out of this. So um, I'm not the greatest at it. My website kind of sucks, but <laughs> I, I think you're going to have a lot of support we'll behind you. Yeah. So it, yeah. So sounds I mean, good. I got, that's the direction I want to go. And I want to, like I said, I want to raise as much money as I can to help people who are in my situation. Uh, and I'm sure there's a few out there that, and if there's people that we can hook you up with, if, or if you're watching and you're someone that can help with yeah. any of these things, whether it's the branding, the merchandise, the website and e-com, or even just setting up a nonprofit, I don't know if that's the route to go with this at this point, but whatever, if you've got suggestions, I'd say reach out to Jeremy, feel yeah. free to reach out to us at Core Lanes and I'll push that to Jeremy. I don't know if you've got an email that you uh, make public at this point yeah the email i got is uh grizzly dude zero one at gmail.com because grizzly dude uh is already taken so whoever has that i want it <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna buy you're gonna have Everything. to buy it so to find it <laughs> <laughs> what's, the, what's the price did i miss it though where do we get your merch uh grizzly dude uh dot ca okay let me look that up www.grizzlydude.ca i got that one <laughs> You can also send a, uh, any questions through there. Um, I got the shipping thing kind of figured out, um, but if there's a, if you want to order merch on there and the shipping seems a little off, just send me a message and uh, I'll hook you up. We'll figure out a way to overcome it. I'm not a tech guy. I'm I'm a bear fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Professional. 
So do you, Perfect. <laughs> where's your, uh, your podcast found Aaron? Actually, first here you go. Here's grizzly dude.ca. Let me share this here real quick, just to make sure everybody has a chance to see it. Boom. So your merch, you've got obviously your book on there. You've got uh, shirts. What are these ones here? Are they the muscle are, shirt and dry, quick dry? Yeah. So I got like the athletics quick dry shirt uh, and then the uh, long sleeve muscle shirts. So those ones are for the, like the the professional bear fighters. They're, you know, very tight and <laughs> make your muscles look nice and big. Uh, the quick dry shirts are uh, just like a regular t-shirt that's uh, great for hiking um, we got uh, cotton t-shirts for men and women. Uh, so the women's shirts come in uh, uh, a wild raspberry. So it's kind of like a pink, camel, and gray. And the men's, I got uh, uh, camel, lime green. Bunch do of you have shirts. hats? I do. I also have baseball caps. Um, it's not you, on here if I you know, yeah, this miss is it. F- uh, that's because uh, I sold out today. So they come off the webpage as soon as they're sold oh, out. Oh, okay. Um yeah, I could send you pictures. And also I have toques, uh, but they also sold out. <laughs> it's that time of year. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it, it happened so quick. I didn't know. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull my comment about buy it on Coralines.com. If you're looking for the book, go straight to his website and buy it directly off Jeremy on the Grizzly Dude if they're in stock. Yeah, yeah. And, and if they're in stock and you want them signed, I definitely sign it. Hey, there you go. That's yeah. cool. And I have personalized it to the person. So excellent Christmas gifts. Yes. Uh, hunt hard, talk free. So I'm looking on the website here. Where do you find that? It looks like just you, you you've got it on YouTube. You got a YouTube channel. We've got a YouTube, a YouTube channel, Coraline Sporting Goods uh, on YouTube, but we're also on Spotify, Apple, everywhere you find your standard okay. um, podcast. You can download There's the hunt hard, talk free. And uh, yeah, Jeremy's actually going to co-host an episode tomorrow night with another epic survival story, but I won't get into that. Um, we're just waiting for the guests to show up tomorrow morning. So, Is, isn't that tonight? Yeah, you don't <laughs> you don't want to uh, advertise too much. I've been burnt a few times. Where it's like, yeah, I got a guy coming on that never happened. never showed up. Yeah. It's, it's part of the this how it goes sometimes. Yeah. But uh, anything else that we should touch on here? Well, so the so what we talked about today is basically the first, I guess, sixty five pages of the book. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's it. I mean, it, it took us. It probably you know it took us three hours to talk about the first seventy five pages. But yeah, I mean, in actual fact, probably take you three hours to read the whole book. Uh, and the book is uh, written more for the. It, I guess it's described as a. Uh, inspirational tragic love story if that makes any sense uh, that's what most of the women listener or readers have told me about it so i mean and it doesn't make sense to me but <laughs> <laughs> um so the book goes through the it's like twilight but for men yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um like 85 percent of the people that buy the book are women which is yeah, yeah. interesting uh <laughs> is it really yeah, that's what I've noticed. Uh, most of, it's mostly women that buy it, oh. and they say they're buying it for their husbands. But mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm buying this for my husband. Can you sign it too, Stacy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the in the book is written, you know, in, in uh, inspirational and about the lessons that I learned uh, from the grizzly bear attack. I mean, what lessons can you learn other than like you know, make sure you have your bear spray on you, um, go with somebody, don't be an idiot. Um, but some of the lessons I learned were, uh, family comes first. Like that's a big thing. You always want to go home safe and sound to your family. So, you know, and be prepared for it. Uh, when you, uh, set, uh, many goals, you can achieve incredible things. Like I didn't think I was, I knew I wasn't going to make it out, but here I am today talking about sharing my story and make sure you get that word out. So when you make those small goals, you can achieve incredible things. Um, and asking for psychiatric help is not a weakness. That that is that is strength, and I can't say enough. If you go through some kind of trauma, talk to somebody. Um, they will help, and trust them when you're when you're talking to them. Don't just think that it's all hokey pokey. They're not going to help you. Uh, trust them. They're there to help you, and they're non judgmental. Uh, uh, no therapist is ever going to be judgmental. They're open minded, and they're there to help you. They, I mean. They won't make fun of you. They won't say anything. Like they're, they're there to help you. Um, yeah, and like family comes first. Uh, that's that's one of the biggest. 
Um, you touched on, I guess, the bear spray too. Uh, I think it'd be worth kind of touching on as far as uh, proper preparation when you're when you're in a in the wilderness. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious and self-explanatory because you were talking about bear spray at the bottom of your pack and your gun was strapped to the side and it was very hard to get to. And we obviously now know that these things, even though they're huge, move fast and can be very stealthy. So, you know, would that be, I think, part of the message is hold the bear spray somewhere accessible and and kind of always be a prepared in what you know with always be prepared for the unexpected but when it comes to the bear spray and being uh bear safer bear awareness is uh one thing that i do now religiously is we practice i bought a case of uh non uh the non-lethal bear spray or the non um bear spray spray to practice with and when i go out fishing in in bear country or hunting in bear country no matter who i'm with with my wife uh with very close friends or somebody I don't know we do a 10 minute uh scenario on bears so we get out the bear spray and we pretend that you know we're walking through the bush and we see a bear what do you do we go through little tips and tricks and i just train the other person to make sure that they know what i know and, and make them comfortable and how do you use bear spray how far does it spray so we get out the cans and we practice spraying it and see how long does it spray for how close does the bear have to be and when you're one of the things that me and my wife like to do lots is cross-country ski and of course you need to snow what's the chances of seeing a grizzly bear well on a nice day there's a pretty high chance it's like one of the things if you see the grizzly bear the person that sees it pulls out their bear spray watches the bear and the person the other person would uh, take off their skis and then help you take off your skis. Uh, the person who saw the bear stays focused on the bear and the other person grabs them by the scruff of the neck or, you know, jacket and walks them out. One person walks backwards, the other person guides them through the bush. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, you're, if you're the one that is guiding the person, you want to, you know, like guide them out so they don't fall over and have the other guy watch the bear, right? Or um, another thing is if you're by yourself and, uh, a bear you run into a bear and you don't have time to pull your bear spray on spray one of the things you can do is you know curl up on a ball is use the bear spray can to protect the back of your neck and just hold it there so if the bear goes to bite you it bites the can or you know you can spray him in the face just little quick little tips little tricks uh you know so we and do it's not going on skate it's just uh minimizing the potential for it to get severe worse. injuries yeah. yeah yeah i mean you're gonna get bear spray in the face it, it does taste okay, but it burns a little bit, but it's way better than being, you know, missing half your face. Well, that's, I think, what a, a lot of people's perception is, is uh, the effectiveness of bear spray is to, you know, whether it's going to actually de deter an attack or a mauling of some kind. And maybe the second would be, you know, the, the fact that the concern of it, you know, blowing back on you and causing, you know, more harm on you and your ability to defend yourself you know when there is an attack i think that's probably one of the the biggest concerns people have when it comes to bear spray and i'd say don't be concerned yeah i wouldn't be get I'm, it use it yeah it's your best chance of survival i mean your face burning for a couple hours is a hell of a lot better than not sleeping for three years i just my point of view no I, well do you get <laughs> well, a lot of feedback know? like that <laughs> Have, have uh, you heard people, you know, voice those concerns? Well, a lot of people would say, well, I'd rather use a gun. Um, you know, they don't they're like a gun would stop them. Well, you're correct. Yeah, a gun will stop them if you hit them in the head and hit them in the brain. But you got to remember, you got an animal running at you. You got one shell. Uh, I mean, mine happened so fast. Even if I had a machine gun aimed at it, the chances of me hitting it and killing it uh, was very slim. Mm -hmm. Like, very slim and i've been charged by you know the year before i got charged by a bear and even if i had a 50 cal machine gun on a tripod aimed at the bear and all i had to do is like hold down some levers to shoot it i think it still would have been screwed like at least with the bear spray it's it's like a mist that comes out or you know it's a little bit of spray but you got a cloud and mist when they run into it it just it stopped them dead and i rather i feel more comfortable with bear spray than i do with a gun hmm. i much rather that that I think that's a message that needs to get pushed a little bit more because I mean, I'll admit I'm one of those guys that would have felt more comfortable with a firearm over the bear spray, but you know, 
I there's a definitely a takeaway, you know, talking and hearing with what you, I might actually, <laughs> next time I'm out, you know, using, I'll bring, I'll get some bear spray now. Uh, it's a, uh, one thing you can look at it is say you're sitting on your couch and you have a Nerf gun and have somebody, you know, um, 50 feet away and you have the Nerf gun sitting beside you loaded and have somebody run at you and see if you can pull that gun out and hit them. Mm. Now, where are you going to hit them? Like, if you can hit them in the forehead, great. You, you know, you good chance that you kill it. But what's the chance you'd be able to pull that out, aim it, and shoot it, and kill the bear in that one shot? I mean, it's pretty hard. I mean, yeah, if the bear's shooting Versus you know, a little water gun and you shoot water, yeah. a mist is probably going to... Like a squirt bottle. If you yeah. take a squirt bottle, pull a squirt bottle and squirt it, you're going to get misted? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're going to get some. It's a hell of a lot better than not sleeping and... Yeah, we have dogs. <laughs> Is now on the recording. <laughs> I like to use a shotgun with two and three quarter, or sorry, three inch with double odd buck, which is nine BBs that are quite large, and and I'm not going to say spray in in a cone fashion as well, but they spread out. Um, and but my wife packs bear spray, so when we're out with our kids, we're hiking, we're in the pine pass, we're wherever, she's got her bear spray right readily accessible, yeah. and I've got the twelve gauge right readily accessible as well, and I mean. I do feel quite confident with a firearm, um, but she's got bear spray. She has her firearms license, all that stuff, yeah. but she packs yeah. bear spray. I pack a 12 gauge yeah. and we're side by side and we're just packing a kid. <laughs> it's for a lot of people that are just hiking too. Yeah. You know, especially yeah. the people that are on uh, tourists and whatnot. Or in, or in we're, parks where you you're parks. Not supposed Dawson to pack. Creek is mile zero on the Alaska highway. You know how many tourists are going up? and yeah, they have like, no like zero <laughs> zero experience or understanding <laughs> they're pulling over i mean i can probably go on for quite some time with different examples and stories but it's i think not just the hunter yeah it's yeah. it's a it's a huge array of different people as soon as you're how many times have we heard of stories in liard yep lots are you packing a firearm in the hot springs nope. uh, maybe some bear spray would probably prevent some so, situations as, as people are camping out there so there's a lot of there's provincial parks you okay. know where a lot of people can't pack but you know maybe but some bear spray might come in handy the average person though could hit a uh a two foot by two foot target at 10 feet with bear spray with a gun the average person couldn't right yeah i'd say with a rifle they couldn't with a shotgun with a buckshot they'd have a better chance i don't know i can't hit a bird at 20 feet with a shotgun <laughs> so um <laughs> Fair enough. That's just me. <laughs> but also you think about coming through Dawson Creek. Quite often the tourists are heading to Alaska. You can't legally pack a firearm from Dawson Creek to Alaska. Oh, exactly. If you're an American, spray. if you're a Canadian, yeah. you can have that can of bear spray with you and head the whole trip and you're protected. Yeah. And when it expires, you can use it as seasoning your meat. I use it as sa to test out how they work once they've expired. Yeah. That's what we do. That's what we eat. The expiry date, is that just a cash grab or is there some legitimacy? No, because the Caspian inside will, breaks down over time, so it doesn't have as much uh, burn Tendency. effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there, so it's got, I'm pretty sure it's Caspian in it, and that's like, uh, uh, that's the burn it's factor. Yeah. It's the, it's the, the how pepper. hot it is on okay. the, the Richter scale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, oh my God, my face is falling off. Yeah. <laughs> Sign a waiver before you eat these hot wings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and pay attention to the to the expiry date because it does it does make a difference. I've done you know quite a bit of research on on bear spray because of this. Uh, I'd actually like to come up with my own brand of bear spray. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's thoughts kicking around about that, um, but uh, pay attention to that and and uh, you can use it multiple times. Like uh, you do it in blasts. Psh, psh, psh. And that works just as good. If you hold it down, you still get about, you know, seven to 15 seconds, depending on what size of can you get. Um, and with bear spray, you know, you wait till they're within that 10 foot range to spray them. You want to make sure you're doing yeah. a good coating. No, that would suck. Not comfortable. Ten <laughs> it's, feet, it's not man. comfortable, but wow. <laughs> it's, uh, it is it is scary when they get that close. It varies, especially when they're charging you. But you want to wait because you want to make sure they get a whole mouthful. Yeah. Um, one thing that bear spray is why it's more effective than, uh, you know, anything else is because it takes out more than one sense. And in order to stop a bear, you got to, uh, you got to take out more than one of its main functions. Uh, like, you know, the nose or eyes or it's breathing respiratory yeah. and yeah. that shuts them right down. You got your sight, your smell and your taste are all being hit with a semi truck in the face. Yeah. And then when every time they take a breath, it burns because it gets into their lungs and that, and that just puts a bear in complete panic mode. 
And that's why it's so effective. It just, it takes on all those senses all at once. And it's just like hitting a brick wall. Holy crap. What is that? And it just burns. Mm. And so like, I mean, if it burns you for an hour, it burns the bear for an hour and it's intense. And the one thing is the bear doesn't understand it. Yeah. The other, that's some really good feed information. I don't think people have actually talked about it in that much detail before. You've changed my mind. I was a doubter, man. I was like, <laughs> let's go and try it. Let's go find a bear. Well, let's, not, do it. let's do it. Let's do it. A couple more whiskeys. That's right. <laughs> we do need another. But uh, the, can I show a picture? Uh, I've got, I actually got you on Facebook, but could we show a picture to the, the viewer or should we hold it. off on there? The other lesson that I want to throw out there while you're getting that loaded up is um, get an in reach. Or get some sort of yes. messaging system that yeah. you can get out that yes. SOS alert. Good call. Modern day, the technology is fairly affordable. You can buy Garmin Minis, which are a couple hundred bucks, and you can get a cheap subscription that costs you 15 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, depending how much you want to use it. Oh. And uh, and it can you can, save your life. You can pause those uh, yep. subscriptions too. So if you're not using it in the winter, you only pay for it for the month that you need it yeah I, I turn mine on at the beginning of hunting season and i turn it off kind of at the end of winter if Here's, i'm out sledding or in the mountains right there this one here yeah oh this one that's it so like the nice thing about the in is is like what uh 15 or 20 dollars a month say. for uh 10 Jesus. 10 messages so you can yeah. send like personal text messages yeah it's a it's an awesome unit so now with uh me going hunting in the bush my wife uh i have to have the garment in reach and i have to send her um messages every couple hours just to make her feel safe and or make sure that she knows i'm safe and i send my wife one every night when i get back to camp when i'm out in the bush i mean two octobers ago now um i headed out october 1st with greg from the store on a, a sheep hunt and we joined a bunch of other guys in camp we had four river boats we drove north and then headed eight hours by boat into the middle of where our base camp was. And the first night I got in there, turned my cell phone on. And I mean, we're talking the, the heat of COVID and, uh, or not my cell phone, turned my inReach on and, um, my, my messaging just blows up. I get like 20 messages all from my wife and I just start reading them out loud sitting in camp and my year and a half old son was in the hospital on oxygen mm. on wow. my first day in camp. Ouch. And I'm reading through and, and just tears started rolling down my face as I'm reading. And I'm sitting a group of nine guys out in camp and Cohen's in the hospital on oxygen and it's nine o'clock at night and just, I'm losing it. I want to get in the boat and head out, but it's nine o'clock at night. You're not doing that, right? No. So I had the, the evening back and forth with my wife and he ended up going home before the next morning. But I mean, just to have that peace of mind, peace of mind, the messaging back and forth, we could get through it and and i mean and then every day i'm messaging her two or three times a day letting her know how i'm doing checking on how he's doing and uh it's it was phenomenal to have that that paid for that device it's the first time i took it out i just bought it before that trip i think we had a scenario where you had to reach out and i went on a rescue mission with jody the porcupine got underneath her truck when she went up to windfall lake when camping what is it three four days how long were you camping for it was three four days anyway and yeah she used the inReach because a porcupine got it underneath there and they love copper. And oh, yeah. It just, nah, nah, they just crap out the of wiring. all the wiring in the truck <laughs> there. And yeah, gave me a shout and the dog had gotten into the damn thing. And yeah, so I went on a rescue mission and yeah. pulled into Chetwin and got some pizza because I was like, yeah, they're probably going to be so yeah, hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We showed up like a freaking superstar. Hey, look at me. Yeah. <laughs> Got some pizza. <laughs> but I, I, I only shut mine off for a few months in the summer now because basically if I'm going to be river boating, well, turn it on, use it. And then yeah. if I'm going to be snowmobiling, turn it on, use it because it's there. You can send yeah. that message for 20 bucks a month. I mean, I spend more than that on coffee or other stupid things <laughs> yeah. that that's your lifeline and you know that 20 a month even if you pay that for like 10 years for that flight in to come get you is like a lifetime a lifetime yep yeah that yeah. peace of mind yeah anything else we got the no. bear spray i mean those are actually really two items that cover a tremendous amount of ground for and have them both on you readily accessible yeah and readily accessible yeah, yeah not in the back of your bottom can you pack. get uh for the bear spray can you get holsters that 
you know, or yeah. something where it's on your chest or yeah. maybe something you we, by your side. Coraline Sporting Goods. There you go. Coraline Sporting Goods. I believe, I believe, they, uh, I believe they sell Coraline <laughs> yeah. Sporting Goods. And There's, they also sell like the best bear spray brand there is. And that's in that's Dawson Creek one. and Yukon? Prince George. Okay, yeah. I was going to say, I've got two Yukon? brands. I don't want to say the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking today. And hey, if you come in uh, to the store when I'm here, you get a signed bear spray. If you purchase it, I'll sign it. There we go. The problem is this isn't live. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> this won't air till a little bit later. This is going to be a while yet. <laughs> All right. Well, you missed the boat. But, but I'll tell you what. After this, I was going to do a little Facebook Live, and we can maybe plug it then because it'll be live, real time. It's freaking midnight right now, so I don't know if many people will be watching, but for like it'll be out there. <laughs> well, three and a half hours. Should we wrap it up? Yep. I guess Okay. So. Thanks again, done. guys. And uh, it was a real pleasure uh, to have you both on. Uh, Aaron, again. Jeremy, I mean, I can't say enough about, you know, how awesome it is to have you here. Uh, the, the the mental um, stability, I don't know what words I want to use, but just the package we had talked about together. Um, it's awesome. And I think, I think you're going to inspire a lot of people. I think we're going to check a lot of things with your story, with some, some of the safety tips that we just kind of threw out there because you changed my mind on some of it. And that could very well be the, the difference between someone getting out on their own two feet or maybe having a very, un, unfortunately, a, an experience like what you had. So, um, you know, to everyone out there, this was my first uh, video. Hopefully it's all good. And, uh, if you're looking for another podcast, because, you know, it's awesome. They're coming pretty popular, and you guys are knocking out some awesome ones. So, well, thank you. Uh, hunt Hard game. Talk Free. <laughs> yeah, Hunt Hard Talk Free. Uh, actually, some people from the United Kingdom uh, reached out to me from that podcast. So that podcast is getting out yeah. worldwide. Um, Atta boy. That's, it, that's awesome. It's an awesome one. I was actually, it's incredible how far it's reached. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad I was invited on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're looking to be a guest or you got a killer story, you can reach out to Hunt Hard Talk Free and Kevin Unscripted. We'll get your stories out there. Absolutely. You bet. Yeah. Thanks for throwing that back. No problem. That's yeah. <laughs> Kevin Unscripted, it's, uh, you know, it's the second best one compared to Hunt Hard Talk Free. <laughs> There's a couple actually other in town that we need to plug a little bit more. It's becoming popular and anybody who's got anything local, I'm all about it. Yeah. I think I'm going to throw one out there now too because we're on it. And I haven't met these guys, but I've listened to a couple and they weren't bad. But they're the uh, blue collar philosophers. They're in Fort St. John. Okay. And uh, they're just a couple of guys that are making a go of this. Yeah. And uh, we'll throw that out there. Yeah. Anybody, I mean, we got a, this area packs a punch. And it's nice if we get some of that Support valuable, con ex um, I'm all about it. Yeah. 100%. Support local. Yeah support local you guys are awesome you guys have a great community up here and it's awesome to see that uh you guys are supporting those bear attack victims and that i that's that's awesome i mean you guys are great one more thing and we're gonna trade this on <laughs> but i have to i've been doing this for a little over a year it's been self-funded and the last episode and this episode i was able to get a bloody sponsor for the, just the two episodes. Excellent. Pretty wow. cool. Dan's Rentals, Fort St. John, and they have Fort St. John and Grand Prairie. I'm going to do a little bit more of a commercial at the beginning. But, I mean, I want to throw that out there. It's like, I'm actually flattered and honored that I got something like that, that there's enough value for someone to be able to throw me money to be able to put their name on this fucking thing. <laughs> so it's awesome. Dan's Rentals. Dan's Rentals. Thanks Dan's Rentals. Much. Thanks, right Dan. on. All right, guys. Pick up your rental clinic from Dan's Rentals. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Yeah, I like it. Grizzly Dude supports Dan Rentals. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap it up. Thanks again. And uh, looking forward to seeing you guys out here. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. It was awesome.